Hello and welcome to the Nausicast. Uh, the Nausicast is where we go through each movie made by Studio Ghibli in release order and discuss our analysis and research findings. Today we're going to talk about the 1992 film Porco Rosso directed by Hayao Miyazaki. And if you don't want to watch the video version on YouTube, we also always provide a download link in the description. And I guess because it's a very monumental event in our Nausicaa's history, I think it's appropriate to mention it here. Our inspiration to get us started on this podcast was actually the Ghibli cast by Digibro and his friends. And I'm proud to report that they ended on Porco Rosso like two years ago. And if nothing goes wrong, we're actually going to surpass them. So that's uh, a huge badge of pride for me. We're going to beat Digibro. Yeah. Digibro, you're called out. If 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 any of you uh, are Digibro fans, call him out. Get him to do the Ghibli cast again. All right, but now I'm gonna go to the uh, introduction section. I'm your host Niad. As always, I, well, I'm not always the host. Platon is also a great host, and he's here again. Platon. Hi, I have returned to talk about one of my favorite films. And we also have the Thunderer. Hello. And our boy Ziff. Hey guys. And uh, the the most recurring co-host Hipster Kusulu. Of all the podcasts in all the world, you had to walk into this one. And uh, here we are <laughs> to talk about Porco Rosso. Yeah. yeah, so let's get right into it. So how did Porco Rosso come to be? So it seems that Miyazaki, being a bit stressed out by the production schedule for Kiki and for producing Only Yesterday, which seems to have taken a huge creative tax on him, felt like making something a bit more lighthearted. So what uh, one thing Miyazaki always did was, meanwhile, he was working his job as a big animator and director of films. He always published small little manga in a, in a plain enthusiast magazine. And one of those uh, manga is called uh, Hikotai Jidai, The Age of the Flying Boat. And it's actually, well, it's literally Porco Rosso, just in like 15 pages. So you have this cute little colorful manga, very lighthearted, of Porco being a big, big, strong hero, saving, like, the girls from the pirates. Wait, this was actually, like, the girls weren't, like, kids in the in the manga version. There's some minute differences. But basically, it goes through the motions and ends in, like, the duel against Curtis. So, the basic plot outline of the film is already given in this old manga. The film, of course, expands in this in many ways we're going to talk about. But the initial idea was... Miyazaki was, I think, not approached, but they were in discussions with like an airline company. And this airline company wanted uh, a little short film out of them, out of Studio Ghibli. One with surprisingly low expectations based on a very lighthearted manga. And Miyazaki spoke fondly of the idea. He pitched this whole uh, thing he called, uh, he wrote down that... Um, he is hoping to have like a colorful, lighthearted film where every character is like clear and straightforward and we just do a 45 minute thing so that, um, and I'm quoting, so that uh, a businessman whose brain has turned to tofu could just sit back, relax and enjoy it uh, while they are taking a, a, an air airplane flight. Yeah, that shows sure a mood. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, as Did it we turn all know, out as that though? That's a real it question. It didn't turn out as this at all. And... That's uh, a very interesting thing um, because he really wanted to, because also his his writing, his manga and his magazine was like kind of, he, he spoke about this as one of the happiest times he had because it's like the, just him indulging in his pleasures with these airplanes that he likes so much and he drew some panels which were like full of detail explaining, oh, this is the engine, this is the body, this is Italian polished wood and so on and so on and so on. And this was really a respite for him. So he wanted to translate that into a film that would be supposed to be like an escapism, a respite from, you know, uh, the hardships of life, from from working real hard, from labor and so on. And it seems that something happened which made the movie grow quite substantially. Uh, I think we'll get into the details of what exactly happened uh, uh, later, won't we? Yeah, but for now, I want to ask you, what are your thoughts on the manga? Who of you has read the manga? I uh, I, I checked it out. Uh, I really like um, his airplane nerdery really, really gets through. Uh, in it. There's a lot of uh, time and attention spent on what are these planes? What are they? How are they constructed? And uh, what, uh, this appreciation for them. There's a diagram at one of the... Uh, it's a 15-page manga, so 
a lot of spaces that there's like a whole half page just spent showing off um this uh, Curtis plane uh, the Curtis character is named D- Donald or something Donald uh, Chuck yeah Donald is Chuck. his name <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but but like the, the plane is um a Curtis plane so basically like the plane name got onto the the character in the, the movie but like like it's it's really shown like exactly how does this plane differ from the uh, from the original um, from the original R three C zero, which uh, oh yeah, which which funny enough um, is the only plane in the uh, in the film that isn't like invented by uh, Miyazaki. Like obviously, all of the planes are inspired by actual uh, technology uh, and designs of planes at the time. But uh, th- th- this was an actual. Uh, exact re- replica of a plane just made with some modifications like how you would make it into a fighter plane uh in, in the t- time of the setting which is the late 20s yeah but and you really need to uh, understand how much this is like this is like a magazine magazine for plane enthusiasts so for all these people who really obsess over planes build model planes and think about historical planes a lot and he just basically constructed his own little elegant, uh, wonderfully shaped, uh, perfectly, um, perfectly useless almost planes, like these, all these impractical old wooden planes that they don't build anymore. And there's even a panel where he says, uh, where, where it's like the character Porco, like thinks to himself, there's nothing as beautiful as the lines of a wooden uh, monocoque body polished to perfection by an Italian craftsman to hell with American rationalism. And I think this embodies like this kind of, um, almost kind of spiritual love for the form and perfection of such an airplane, even if it's not, like, rational, right? It's not manufactured by, like, a huge automated chain of, like, whatever, conveyor belts and uh, factory workers. No, it's it's like a handcrafted kind of loved thing. And this is, like, really his love for these airplanes shining through here. Yeah, I believe they say directly that there was only ever one plane of Porco's make made, and it's it was basically impossible to fly as is, and he had to make so many modifications just to get it in the air. So it's oh, like yeah. it's like purposely this like kind of fantasy plane that's so impractical, it's stupid, but it's just because it like looks real cool and neat, and it's like wooden, it has that feel to it. There's this a uh, really kind of a uh, Japanese sense of uh, of like craftsmanship and respect for the masters, um, which really uh, comes through. Especially, like you said, Nyad, it's um, this appreciation for and nostalgia for the time when uh, engines were designed and crafted and not engineered and produced, uh, like in in, uh, in factories and stuff. There's this sense that there's something. Um, yeah, the, the the this idea of the the craft of uh, aircraft, which is is just really like the great nice type of nerdery, the type you you can appreciate even if you have no yeah. idea what planes are. You appreciate the character's appreciation and the director's appreciation for it. Yeah, I also find yeah. it pretty funny as a kind of like a coincidence that Porco is this character who's attached to this like old world style of like wooden plane that's impractical. But in the 20s, like, you know, like metal based planes and like m- new flashy designs are on the rise. And Porco Rosso would actually be like the last proper film Miyazaki did entirely without uh, using computers because he would use um, some computer effects to help making Mononoke. And then I believe they digitally colored the rest of the Ghibli films after that. So this is almost like a last swan song for like very traditionally animated films that Miyazaki well, would do. He went, he went back with Ponyo and Ponyo is entirely done by hand. Oh, I, I didn't know that. So fair enough. Oh, that's interesting. Um, Something you look forward to when we talk about that film. Hmm. Yeah, there's, there's, there's also an uh, old interview uh, of, of Miyazaki um, where he, he specifically laments the lack of individuality in design after airplanes uh, became designed to go faster than like 300 kilometers an hour. That's when aerodynamics became like supreme over uh, design. And he, he, he specifically says that... Um, there isn't room anymore for that kind of uh, individuality. It it moves into the realm of the hobbyist or disappears under the pressure of complex infrastructure. The Italians, uh, he says, were masters of that kind of individuality. But once the technology became more and more advanced uh, and needed more and more infrastructure, that individual expression disappeared. And I think that's kind of like also part of the the movie itself, this fight for the individual expression uh, yeah. but but we'll get into that when we talk about yeah. characters in depth 
So one thing I really found remarkable about this manga is that um, Miyazaki himself said about this, and I found this in a quote on Wikipedia actually, about the Miyazaki Daydream Data Notes art uh, thing, which is like the series of basically short form manga that he wrote like this. Um, he said, the truth is that I am happiest when I'm writing about stupid airplanes and tanks and magazines like model graphics. Like, we gotta imagine like a overworked Miyazaki here just really going into these like model magazines with his nerdy obsession with planes and just he knows it he's writing manga about stupid airplanes and tanks and he's just loving it like this is his respite and this is like an interesting and powerful idea to me like he's he's the director known for these masterful masterfully crafted animated movies in japan and he's so perfectionist and this manga is just really easygoing. It's just really like he has some these frames where he's like, uh, because I don't have many pages, uh, our hero instantly finds the the, the pirates, yeah, like so just like, skipping it between. Like he's joking around breaks. with it. He's taking it so easy. Yeah, that feels mm. like that really keys into one of the um, the real sense of the um, the place in the film, like the way that everything is so like easygoing as like a like a fun heroic adventure. So you can see how Miyazaki trying to wanted to to keep that spirit alive throughout the film, even though he did layer on like a lot more theming on top of it. Yeah, you you could say that this is kind of like the skeleton of the film, right? This kind of feeling of um of like easygoingness, of like this sort of hedonistic pleasure seeking, not really pleasure seeking, but it's like uh, adventure going seeking. Uh, yeah, yeah, adventure seeking and just going on day by day without like looking at like some big ideology ideological reason to uh to attach yourself to basically so yeah i believe this is like opening up one half of the movie already which is why it's such a good jumping off point to talk about the movie or such a nice context because um when we when we get deeper into what thematically differs and like uh, plot wise differs in the movie we're gonna open up a, a whole like discussion of what exactly do these changes mean and how were they introduced and it's a really interesting thing but before we get there I would actually uh, love to get back to some other like production or contextual fun facts before we get into the more meaty situation so one thing is that um, Marco Pago is like the real name of Porco Rosso right um, this is a reference or homage to the Pago brothers the pioneers of Italian animation Nino and Tony Pago and whose son Marco and G uh, whose sons Marco and G Pago were working together with Miyazaki on his production of Sherlock Hunt, the TV series in the early 80s that di Miyazaki directed. That's a very cute little reference I find. Yeah, that's that, that's nice. Uh, that actually um I I thought it wouldn't be relevant at all but um I noticed uh, one of the um there's a scene in the movie where um this fairy is uh, trying to protect themselves against the pirate alliance and Curtis by sending out their own uh, ace pilots to fight them. And they, they get introduced, all pomp and circumstance, you know. And one of them mm -hmm. is named Visconti, who is a, 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 an it Italian uh, film director, most uh, known for writing um, uh, The Death in Venice. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. So there's even more references that I didn't pick up on. Yeah, definitely. And then, of course, there's Curtis named after the... Yeah, oh, the, Michael Curtis yeah, the, from Casablanca. Well, yes, but also like the, the Curtis plane. Yeah, that that the, that the Curtis That's model. Like, there's there's, there's zero, two yeah. meanings, yeah. Yeah, Don 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 Curtis uh, playing, yeah. And another extremely weird fact, and this, the, I'm almost sad about this fact right now because it would have been like a historical first. Because in 2011, Miyazaki said that he actually wanted to make a follow-up anime to the film, as like Porco Rosso, the Last Sortier. And it was supposed to be set during the Spanish Civil War with, with Porco appearing as a veteran pilot. Obviously, Spanish Civil War is, is, is another that's going to be make much more sense in context we later talk about. But of course, like the Spanish Civil War had like a huge leftist, uh, anti-fascist um, uh, military against the fascist takeover in Spain and so on, like all this stuff. And this film was supposed to be uh, written by Miyazaki and directed by Yonobayashi. But, you know, it, it never happened. And... Somewhat I'm glad because Poco Rossi really ends on a on a very fantastic conclusive ending. But also it would have been very interesting to see the very first ever Ghibli sequel. Yeah, I, I definitely would have wanted to see it. 
Well, I, I, I don't know. I, th- yeah. I think it might. I think it might have been the right decision not to, because I really love the ending of this film, which we'll get yeah. to uh, much later. Absolutely. So I know it's kind of interesting you mentioned Death, Death in Venice because um, the, the, the the visual um, work is uh, the, the visual piece of literature was by Thomas Mann, and uh, Miyazaki is very interested in Thomas Mann, as you'll see later in The Wind Rises, where he basically framed it entirely around the Magic Mountain. Um. So and other than that to really get into what changed and how the film, which kept getting longer and longer during the production, which turned from a 45-minute thing, suddenly creeping more scenes and more characters into the one and a half hours thing, we need to get now into the historical context. Namely, things that Miyazaki very explicitly talked about in interviews when uh, when asked about Porco Rosso. Namely, that basically at the same time as he was uh, getting into making the film, uh, the war in Yugoslavia broke out, which basically, to do a short, brief historical summary, like for most of the uh, Cold War, Yugoslavia had one uh, a leader called Tito, who seems to, through some, uh, and what has now historically been considered, or by many people is considered a better implementation of socialism, and also for Miyazaki personally, was seen as a very effective uh, form of socialism and a measure that put at ease, or like, reduce ethnic tensions in that area that had been like plaguing it for decades and during Tito's reign it brought there a huge stability uh, an unprecedented stability for the region and like after Tito's death and 10 years later this destabilization resulted in an outbreak of this of an ethnic war which was extremely cruel extremely destructive many lives were lost and it really was an event that disillusioned Miyazaki even harder, right? He, we already talked a lot about Miyazaki and his relationship with, um, uh, let's say, more uto- utopian ideas and projects. And at this point, he had actually already said, nah, he's given up on the idea of, of communism and socialism and all these Marxist ideas. But in an interview, he talked about the fact that this Yugoslavian uh, situation actually was one of the things he still clung to as like one example where he said, well, maybe, maybe, and then it broke down. Ethnic war, cruelty, destruction, and that broke him. And fittingly enough, like Yugoslavia, especially like the Adriatic coast and the Croatian regions, um, is exactly where the film Poco Rosso is set. So Miyazaki then introduced more elements of fascism, uh, of the rise of fascism, and more political elements, more tragic elements to the original kind of manga framework. Basically, everything that was added, Gina and the, the, the Italian fascists that were only like alluded to and mentioned in the manga, but not at all covered, comes all from this moment where Miyazaki realized that having respite, having like an escapism from all this reality isn't actually possible. Where it crept into his more escapist fiction and made it so that it had a much more clouded moral outlook and much more clouded and uncertain future. And it's interesting because on, on top of that historical context, also this is a right um, around when Japan, Japan's like great like economic boom that like like came to its to its like highest point in the like throughout the eighties like fell apart and there was a huge crash in the Japanese economy and Porco Rosso was set during the Great Depression. It really. Clearly, he's reflecting these these historical moments that he's taking and putting it back in the past. Well, it's not exactly during the Depression, but it's at the very start of the Great uh, Depression, when uh, w- w- just when the New York stock market crashes and it's starting to arrive in Europe and uh, tensions are rising. Um, so, so in that way, it's it's really like strangely prescient that it just uh, that, that it came out right at the start of uh, what uh, has been become known as the Lost Decade. Yeah. Uh, so it is uh, it is brought up that like all the men are away working and that's where we exactly, have to see exactly. the women that, in the it, factory. It started it started but like it, it's not entirely a, a, a depression yet but the downturn has begun uh, for real. So that's uh, and that that really like th- that context and the context of uh, of fa- fascism rising really colors a lot of the movie and you can you can really see this um this tension between uh, the adventure and reality. Like the the beginning of the the movie is like just the opening scene is straight uh, ripped from the from the manga where uh, Porco, uh, who's of course the bounty hunter, uh, uh, former ace pilot of the uh, Italian Air Force, um, he uh, he gets a call that uh, the these air pirates, the Mama Yuto gang, have uh, kidnapped a bunch bunch of hostages, 
uh, and he goes and he takes care of them and it's a lighthearted adventure um like like just like, like it could be a short film on, on its own um but then afterwards we get this uh, this uh, denouement this uh, this calming uh, of, of of the tone as we uh, arrive at um the uh, uh, hotel adriano where all this political context starts to uh, to creep into the film yeah i think it's really interesting how like uh, how the, the, these sorts of choices are clearly like you can clearly see them in the film when you're looking out for them yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're taking these two meta narratives like the, the meta narrative of Jap- japanese exceptionalism and the meta narrative of communism especially in eastern europe two things two meta narratives Miyazaki was always critical of but always seem to be tentatively um optimistic about like oh can these things like really succeed can we like really make something beautiful out of these things and then he just watched them crash around him like had to spur or had to turn into this what it was not not just a, it couldn't be a lighthearted adventure it had to be criticizing it had to be like almost taking apart these like masculine historical like um hero hero narrative that it was originally yeah. supposed to be another funny thing i wanted to remark on was um while we're on the discussion of historicity or historical uh, elements at least is that um it, it's not actually historically accurate right so uh, the rise of fascism in italy was already around the the start of the 20s um and the depression only hit near the 30s so uh, 1928 so i mean the movie plays 1929 29 yeah yeah, that's why. But like the emergence of fascism, as we've seen, like um, Italian fascism is already ar- arisen. But whenever we are like on land, except in Milano, obviously Milano is obviously already like fascist occupied. But uh, the other scenes are all Croatia and Croatian islands, which are not yet quite as, I guess, influenced. You could say. Yeah, I suppose so. But like, what I wanted to say was that that the these elements are more chosen for thematic reasons than for historical reasons and i mean uh, obviously yeah <laughs> yeah i mean you could say that or you could say that the uh the exact time period was chosen because of the his history there uh like you you could have put it uh like a bit earlier where like fascism wasn't as uh established where the depression wasn't starting but like it's it's a choice to uh, to set it in uh, 1929, and it's a it's a really interesting one. But I think what you were what, what you're picking up on uh, it isn't necessarily that it's ahistoric, but that it it, it kind of um, uh, in the same way that the setting is this sort of uh, kind of pan European or like at least pan Adriatic uh, setting with these uh, islands and cities and towns and people. Uh, in the same way that the time period is sort of like an amalgamation of, of, of these uh this this time capsule of what the the um the atmosphere would, would be ar- be at around that time so it's not necessarily that he actually goes to a place yeah, I, I really feel like the setting is maybe to me the biggest like character in the film in the way that we get um first of all it's it's very integral that it's all like this sea plane based world where it's like the the huge adriatic sea and it's um all these planes that are like have such mobility because again we always say like the planes are freedom and like you can fly and you can also like land anywhere because it's a boat essentially so you kind of get this um you kind of get this world where like uh the pilots can go anywhere they're not limited to anything like all the the big hotel where they all meet is just right in the middle of us of a lake or so so it's like it's even hard to get there unless you're a pilot and uh the same for like the the little island they do the uh, the competition off in the end and uh, much like um, like in Casablanca that we alluded to, it's um, it really comes off like this kind of purgatory where all these characters are. Like in Casablanca, everyone's trying to like leave and get to America, and it's kind of like this in between space where no one really wants to be, and it's where Rick has his bar because just like uh, Porco, he's kind of just uh, content on being nobody, of just kind of like this um this person caught in its in-between stage in his life and yeah. Porco can't move on. And, and in-between is like a good point. I think in Casablanca as well, you have like all different political like factions and affiliations all in that same bar, just as in Hotel Adria- Adriano, Hotel Adriano. Yeah. Um, because you, you have like the scene where like the pirates and the American are quarreling and Porco is, 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 is 
talking to them and just being challenged to to you know uh an encounter with curtis and all this kind of stuff and like gina is taking care of that place she's like uh soothing the conflict solving the conflicts like because it's all this this space which is like a liminal space of different like people different positions that are all like being peaceful even the pirates say we won't fight within a radius of like 50 miles of this place as you know gina obviously um this I, I think is it's actually how... kilometers because it's in europe yeah kilometers right true mm-hmm. but um, yeah, it's um, basically a melting pot idea right yeah i, I think the the parallels to casablanca are definitely there like especially with uh, hotel adriano being a, a clear uh, parallel to the uh, gin joint in uh, Casablanca, which again has this uh, this uh, status as a, a neutral ground uh, b- between all these different factions, uh, all, all kept in check by a charismatic uh, host. Or in this case, hostess, because like the roles in, in that way are kind of reversed. Um, I also uh, there's also of course the fact that we have this. Um, will they want they type romance between these uh, two mature characters with a past uh, all set in, in this shadow of war or at least in this case oh, yeah. looming war because Casablanca was uh, set like uh, 12 or so years uh, after uh, yeah during the second exactly, world war do, during the second world but war where like this makes yeah. it another liminal space right it is their their love is kind of star crossed because of the war that has been in the past the first world war which has shaped their lives, uh, Porcus and Gina's lives, but also the upcoming war looms over them already. So that's that's also an interesting kind of idea that happens in Hotel Adriano and between these characters. Well, um, so something I also wanted to just uh, mention is, um, like, like clearly C- Casablanca is a reference point uh, for the film, but kind of in the same way that like most capital R romances since Casablanca have uh, had to like deal with that film's legacy as uh, it's not so I, I don't think it's as direct uh as, as Porco's character is very close in many many ways to uh rick in 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 casablanca oh, also definitely he has arc. that like the whole idea of yeah. the cynical distance and these this male escapist space that is like being this this guy at the gin bar or rather the guy is secluded in some adriatic island like the almost always has the quip on his lips like never really I mean, until later when Theo comes, which we're going to talk about, never really f- smiling, always just kind of like this cynic and and suave uh, dude in a trench Very coat, stoic, or like. Yeah. yeah, I think that's the closest comparison there. Like, um, Porco's snappy comebacks about being a pig are so clearly like guarded uh, sarcasm of him not trying to like expose his real feelings very similar to Rick's insistence on being neutral and not drinking with guests and not meddling with the political affairs after his more or less political like engagement in the past which has like kind of left him disillusioned yeah uh, but that's again definitely uh, clear parallels uh, but, but what I find it is more interesting is uh, the differences like for instance how um there the, there's no um they don't we don't really uh, get a conclusion where these main characters actively fight, uh, actively resist. Um, where like like Casablanca, the whole deal with it is that the only thing more important than true love is fighting fascism, which we can all get behind. Um, yeah. <laughs> but 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 in this, there's this sort of uh, stronger powerlessness uh, to 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 oh, these yeah. characters and that uh, the the defenses they put up. Um, and this is also something that Miyazaki has talked about a bunch in in the interviews related to Porco Rosso. I have one here, which is um, basically I have I've, I've changed and summarized the quote a little bit, but let me read it out. No matter how messy things get, we have no choice but to go on living. Up until the 80s, there was a view of the future which included an end times. We were thinking too naively. Soviet Union collapsed, Yugoslav ethnic conflict. I came to realize that end times will not be as neat as an affair as I had imagined. No matter the destruction, we still have to go on living. Heading into the 21st century, nothing has been resolved. Everything's been dragged into the new era, so we'll just have to so we'll just have to go on living, repeating the same stupid mistakes over and over again. And I feel like this is embodied here. Yeah, that's definitely how the film kind of ends it, by having this like specter of fascism come up, wash across the Adriatic, but our characters are kind of left in an in-between zone. We see that they years later they're still alive, a lot of them, and they're still kind of living there, but you know, the problems are still gonna arise. And we purposely get a vague ending that implies Porco went to Gina, but you know, it doesn't quite confirm it because I think Miyazaki maybe at the time didn't want to be like 
too like positive. He wanted to leave just a little yeah. bit of doubt. The thing Isn't that it hits like me clear here is that how the resistance China, is. Though? The thing that res uh, the, the the thing that hits me here most is that the resistance is comes in the form of a yearning for lost utopianism, for lost hope basically for lost political ideals but instead of like falling into like at the end at least instead of falling into nihilism and and and, and pure hedonism you have to kind of move move on and live live on you no matter how messy it is but yes if please i i <laughs> interrupt oh you. yeah no problem it was um it was only a very short thing but like the in the end narration um Theo said that she became friends with uh, Gina, but never saw Porco again. So wasn't it like pretty heavily implied that they didn't get to together? We, we'll we'll and, discuss uh, the ending later. Uh, yeah, yeah we're going to anyway. discuss the ending later. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I have I have I have have some shocking uh, evidence uh, gathered that I can present to you later. Yeah. But I wanted to talk about one thing for me that embodies best this idea that I just presented of this yearning resistance, namely the song that Gina sings. Le Temps de Chiris. Yeah, Le Temps de Chiris, a song, uh, a French song that has specifically been written in the context of the Paris Commune, which obviously, uh, well, not obviously, for everyone in the historical context, basically the Paris Commune in the uh, 1870s was a very short-lived socialist utopian experiment where the, basically uh, a commune in Paris was formed, which after only two months of uh, existing and bringing forth like uh, labor equality and lots of uh, equality of women and all these progressive uh, socialist projects and was at the time like the symbol of like leftist projects in philosophy like Karl Marx was deeply inspired by it and this is like kind of the model how he imagined the world should be and whatever and it was struck down in bloody violence and like the 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 poet who wrote the song Le Tom de Chiris uh, just kind of combined this litany and lament of the failed commune uh, through somewhat this love song uh, with a sense of loss and you know yearning in it like the time of the cherries is this is uh would be the translation of the title and it like it has the sense of ephemerality to it like this beautiful thing that was created like this deep love just ended before it could come to its conclusion to its fulfillment and gina here in this bar sings this song that is harkening back to the socialist utopian project of the 1870s at the dawn of the rise of fascism in italy and europe in general and this to me like strikes perfectly the tone and the note of what this movie is going for like we yearn for these lost ideas but the song already contains that it was ephemeral and is lost and that it was already struck down yeah, and it's a motif that uh, that returns, especially at the end credits, where with a, a Japanese, I, th I think a Japanese like cover slash translation uh, of the song. Um, what 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 I find especially beautiful about uh, the the song is how it's not only about how there's um the, the, there's this fleeting time uh, of of the chairs, this yeah. fleeting spring. But also how uh, the singer, uh, the, the the lyrics say that I, I wouldn't like trade it for anything. That you you should be uh, prepared for the loss of love if you want to actually love something. And this it's is very so, Monon Albare. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. yeah. We return to this every movie. <laughs> our, our old <laughs> friend Monon Albare returns yet again to the podcast. Monon Albare Chan. Well, if, 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 you, if, if, you, if you even just like read the lyrics, like it's it's it almost feels like an old Japanese poem. Like it, like like here's like a, like a verse. Like it's very short. The ch cherry time when we go off dreaming to harvest some earrings, cherries of love drifts to like falling through the leaves like drops of blood. But it's very short. Cherry time pendants of pink coral which we harvest while dreaming. Like that that could be an old Japanese poem, yeah, especially with the, the cherry blossoms. It. That's hella Japanese. <laughs> yeah, and but like, falling like drops of blood. Showing like the, the violence associated with the like, with the love and the violence. Yeah. It's yeah. And the, the, yeah. And the whole anti-fascism and socialism is like a, th uh, a an ongoing motif throughout the film, uh, and and and, yes. and labor rights in a way, um, and, and women's equality. Uh, so, so in that yeah. way, it's it, yeah, it really <laughs> sums the movie up. It's a great, uh, great, great insert song. Um, also, um, just to before we like lose tra track of this. But because this socialism and communism also informs like Porco Rosso and the view that kind of also Miyazaki takes on these things. 
Um, because in an interview that I read where an interviewer was pressing Miyazaki like on the idea because Miyazaki insisted, yeah, Porco is just supposed to be this funny character because it's a pig that's funny, haha. But then the interviewer pressed him and, and Miyazaki basically said, well, yeah, um, Miyazaki talks about Yugoslavia and says, well, I long ago was uh, swept away my belief in socialism. But in making the film, all this disillusionment and regret piled up and I had the feeling that I will be the last red. And the vision of that single pig flying alone came to me. Yeah, in the red plane, guys, it's yeah. red. The crimson pig, it's a commie. That, that's what it means. A, a disillusioned, regretful, yearning commie. Yeah, that's true. But um, we're talking very, uh, very negative, depressed stuff right now. And But I do think there's also a sort of positive, affirmative attitude to the film. Because the question remains... How do we come out of this conclusion on the other hand? Like, we can't just say, um, oh, it's all over. Let's just, you know, sit down, do nothing and and rot or something. I don't think that the film actually, the text of the film actually is like this. I think... Oh, that's where we start, yeah, right? I agree yeah. completely. Yeah. Yes, okay. So that's, that's, that's where I wanted to kind of add something. But because... I think the death of this old meta narrative of this old like yes let's do the utopian project is kind of framed as something that is necessary. And I think if you look into the decks deeply I think you will come to the conclusion that there is a sort of grain or start of a new era of socialist practice in here which uh maybe I could allude to later or now. But I, I think, mean, we'll, I think we'll, we'll get into the all ending. the characters, and, yeah. so I suppose we'll get there. Yeah, yeah. But before we get to yeah. that, though, I, I wanted to uh, mention that all, all this we've been talking about, all, all the these uh, this seriousness that that comes from like the Hotel uh, Adriano, all the Casablanca parallels, um, all the uh, the socialism and stuff. It, it it's added like on to uh, the manga, which we talked about earlier. All uh, yeah. the, the manga is the entire uh, like. Uh, part of the plot with uh, with Theo, with Curtis, with the uh, dog fighting and adventuring and repairing the airplane and stuff like that. Um, whereas everything else uh, like like uh, gets uh, added into it. And, and the mix of those two things, I think, is what really gets at the, uh, the soul of the movie, not just the somber moments, but the high flying yeah. adventure, which so like if we're talking references, then we have like on the one hand Casablanca and these war dramas and that kind of stuff, but on the other hand, you also have this cartoon that's on top of it. Um, like there's uh, obviously like there's a direct reference to like old, really classic uh, like Disney cartoons or like th uh, things like uh, Betty Boop uh, when uh, Porco is uh, at the cinema with his old uh, friend from the Italian Air Force, but also. Um, has anyone here read Tintin? Uh, yes. Um, Tintin's quite good. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I can kind of see the parallels there as well. Yeah, really because... Similar kind of adventure stories. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it, it's this uh, classic uh, adventure serial, which uh, uh, it was written from like around the, the, like the late 20s uh, up into the 70s uh, by a Belgian uh, uh, writer, Ergie. And... Um, and I, th I think it definitely influenced this type of adventurousness and uh, th this uh, traveling around uh, and uh, Europe having different adventures. Um, l last one I wanted to mention in terms of cartoons. I think there's a lot of like Popeye in the pirates. Um, <laughs> yeah. Especially the Mama Yutu uh, gang, you know, the, with uh, the, the whole like super macho thing. Uh, but goofiness um like those are definitely like whenever mama yuto gang is around then it it's just like silly cartoon fun uh th yeah, they're that um, kind of villain uh, yeah best, like best card in the whole movie for me is the one where they got to take the photo and he knocks everyone else out of frame <laughs> in like a fourth of a second. yeah I, w I was thinking like how did that happen like it was such a so a, uh, a fast instance like how does he just knock yeah. out like 12 <laughs> like years in one second no but um uh, but, but yeah they uh also uh if, if you didn't know uh mama ayuto is like italian for uh mommy help 
<laughs> that's oh. pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I think I think that actually is like a really good little piece right there because um to me the whole thing with the pirates and basically all the scenes set in the the Adriatic with the seaplanes really is this kind of like world of immaturity that Porco and these pirates kind of exist in and it's kind of like Porco's hideaway because he likes to play the um the archetypal stoic cool bounty hunter and they're the ridiculous yeah. silly pirates but like also, the film yeah. the yeah. film also, communicates the hero never kills no yeah yeah the hero never kills in like the traditional archetype but also it's very clear also, that like the bad guys yeah. in this don't even kill like they're taking a bunch of little girls hostage and they're completely just like they don't they're care. loving it they're yeah. loving it they're just <laughs> crawling and, and, and over the them, ship and having yeah. fun they, so they, they, they have absolutely no intention of harming the girls at any point yeah. you know I mean, you say that, but you know they're obviously very reckless, and and it's it's still kind of obvious that they don't really value. No, but they, human they, life they, 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 as they, much as they maybe they, should. But like, it's still powerful. framed as kind of goofy and like, yeah. uh, ultimately kind of harmless. The motif that we have here is, in my view, like the film starts out with his easy morality. First of all, the bad guys are like goofy bad guys who do like goofy bad guy things and yeah. blah, blah, blah. And there comes Porco Rosso. He, he uh, uh, ruins their plan yet again. Oh, you damn crimson pig. But then you gradually get the corruption kind of of this issue. Like we have the idea that the fascists are recruiting like Adriatic pirates and including them into their air force and all this kind of stuff. And we realize like, the, the simple, almost escapist morality where it's super easy to point at the pirate and say, those are the bad guys, we are the good guys, I am the good guy, I am the man, hero, pig, and I'm going to solve the issue. And then the film gradually de develops into in a way where it isn't actually this simple. Yeah. While the ending of the film with a big old dumb fist fight obviously is like a kind of swan song to like this kind of simple morality and heroism, we get the sense that this is a space that cannot that, that cannot be like safe. Until yeah, the fascists come, literally. That's definitely Damn, the ending yeah. of the film. The fascists roll over and destroy everything in a sense. But yeah, I really feel like that's the kind of thing Miyazaki was most trying to encapture, in which like the bad guys aren't even like bad. Like sure they threaten, but like they're they're so cartoonish. There's such like a hyper reality applied to all their yeah. scenes. Like they throw a grenade into like a crowd of people, but not <laughs> a single person is hit by it. So you can truly like understand. Yeah. Like even their guns, when they finally get uh, him and Curtis, when they finally get locked on each other, Curtis's guns just jam because no one dies in this movie. Like, it's not that kind of movie. So, it really creates this sense of basically everyone feels like a child at play. Like, Porco, Curtis, all the pirates, they feel like young boys just like playing this game, like kind of living outside of reality. Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's exactly like that. It's like this. It's, it's a game. Like this. It's a performative. Like Porker gets the call. Oh, I gotta come and come and save all these these girls. They're like, oh, they're fifth. They're like they're fifteen of them. We can't. The pirates. They're fifteen girls. We can't take them all. Like, oh no, we have to take them all. It'd be so. It'd be cruel to split them up. So it's like more like they're being careful to make sure every single moment of it is like is like just like they're letting the girls like like sit up up above and like look at the guns and like they spot out Porco. So everyone's everyone's clearly playing playing games here, as as you said, hipster. Like, also, no, they're on the water. It's so dangerous. Is, never mind we're on the swim team yeah we're we swimming swim. exactly exactly they all they all just jump into the water and it's, it's fine like <laughs> it's like it, and, 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 and porco like allows them to keep half the money and he takes half the money and the, and, the, and the girls from the ship so it's like it's like this 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 like very like simplistic oh the bad guys go and kidnap the yeah. girls and then the good guy comes and save the girls and but and that's and that's and that's, and that's just, and they need the world to be that way because they're yeah. so and like, it's setting up the cartoon right the yeah. next episode is gonna come because the pirates had just enough money to repair their airship yep i mean i think that might be true i still think what what miyazaki did here was very skillful because you have to see this in a sort of dichotomy right the the pirates the sea pirates there contrasted with the actual danger the perceived danger of being the outlaw of being the 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 other uh, the criminal uh here are portrayed as being kind of goofy and ultimately relatively harmless whereas the the real sort of threat the looming violence comes instead from the fascist state so i think miyazaki very skillfully uh portrayed this in that yes the vagrant and the criminal they are kind of harmless and this and that but ultimately it is the the state that is the biggest danger to um to the people as a whole 
Yeah, I, I think it's more about like the idea that in an age of this kind of fascism and uh, ethnic conflict and war rising, he's sim it's just like a meta message. Like he's saying yeah. such a simple adventure story is not possible anymore. Yeah. Like yeah. In, a, in, a, in a sad way, it is kind of lost. And it, link and it links and it links up with like the whole like the death of the, the, the meta narratives that, that, that Miyazaki and Japan are dealing with in the early 90s. Um, and it's just the same thing. This is the death of the hero meta narrative. So it's like he's, he's taking he's taking these these historical ideas and expanding them into like the structure of how stories are told. I, I think it's really interesting uh, this theme of maturity and immaturity you've uh, pointed out because um, where, where we have like maturity means this re recognizing uh, in a way your uh, your powerlessness and re recognizing that the, the the power structures around you and the like cruel realities and stuff like that and immaturity being this uh this adventure serial like the, this tintin part uh, instead of the casablanca part but i i, I think um uh, it's interesting to talk about how fio fits into this because she's at like a middle stage like she's uh in a coming of age story uh, of her own uh she's uh, like 17 years old so she's between those uh, two and her arc i don't think is like she, she she definitely like uh, I I think she definitely matures by the end, especially as we hear that she's actually like talking to us from uh, the future of the film. Um, but like I don't think her arc is about learning this sort of uh, the, this sort of cynicism or the cru the cruelty yeah. of war. Uh, it's it's more complicated than that, I, I, and I think that gets to like part of this movie's uh, soul is that both. The Casablanca part and the Tintin part is like real, and th this movie believes in both of them. Yeah, I think Theo's best role, Theo's major role in the film, to me, seems less like kind of coming to a maturity from her perspective, but like allowing Porco to like come to a maturity. Because in a lot of ways, I feel she comes off far more mature and like understanding than Porco does, because he's seen the world and he's grown a bit jaded to it, and now he lives in this escapist childish world of good guys and bad guys but she allows him to like just open up a bit more and kind of accept his guilt and his um his problems and like as we see in the end it's implied that Porco's turned back into a man so she kind of like it's it's not the kiss that she gives him that transforms him but it's it's the confidence to move on to a, like a better world and leave the uh, the playland of the Adriatic behind that's a, I suppose this is a good a yeah. time as any to go into the characters one by one and really work yeah. through them because we started alluding to all of them a little bit, but I think we can really tie it together if we just get into them right, right now. Yeah. So obvious start would be Porco, right? So Porco is a very interesting character. After all, he has this kind of <laughs> split identity between the pig who excludes himself from society and always contrasts himself from whatever is going on with this. This, this doesn't apply to me because I'm a pig who has also this duality of having been a human and rather even by the end of the film maybe turning back into a human well it's strongly implied obviously like we know he's turning back into a human um in a interesting interview and uh i hope i can find this quote now because it found it really 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 remarkable um miyazaki in an interview about like during the time basically where he wrote Porco Rosso, another interview by the way, I found so many interesting interviews in, in reference in different texts that I read. Um, getting to this age, I'm starting to dig up all kinds of memories from my childhood and my past. After digging them up and arranging them, I come to see uh, this is what formed me. And at the same time, this guilt coils around my memories. And if I lose that guilt, then somehow I have the feeling that I lose the most important thing about myself. I even feel that the guilt is that which really supports me. Uh, and Miyazaki says, embracing a divide itself is how I must go on. And isn't it kind of striking how Porco is literally divided into these two kind of characters? Like we have the sense that there is a Marco, the 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 man who back then basically in World War One disappeared and was replaced by Porco the pig who is carrying this guilt with him that shaped him and brought him where he is right now. Oh yeah, so... Uh, we're getting right into the meat of it, right? So survivor yeah. guilt is a very much uh, a part of uh, Porco's character, probably one of the most central parts of him. We have this uh, wonderful scene where he tells uh, Theo the story um, of uh, when he had this near-death experience and saw his uh, all these uh, these pilots, his friends, one of them, uh, Bellini, uh, had just yeah, married. had just married Gina, exactly. by the way, yeah. uh, like two days earlier. Yeah, like, like he, he he describes, and we see this 
a beautiful uh, field of uh, of whiteness of clouds, uh, and above it, uh, this streaking, uh, like like almost like a, a starry, uh, a, a streak of stars uh, going across the sky like a jet stream, and we uh, and it turns out every single one of those like lights are uh, is a plane of a fall uh, a fallen uh, pilot who's uh, like flying there in the, in the afterlife and he begs his friend not to go that he, he that he'll go in his stead and because he can't take care of Gina he uh, she needs him and but he he, he doesn't live and that yeah. adds a lot of gravity to a few times when Porco mentions like he uh, when he he toasts the, the those who have gone uh, before and says the, it's always the good ones that die implying yeah, that he is not yeah. one of the good ones. In, in in context of this scene, I found it very interesting that uh, I felt like, and, and this source, uh, uh, Susan Napier in Miyazaki World seems to support this, that the airplanes sort of look like dragonflies, which in general is, is a, like a common symbol of ephemerality in Japanese. And this is backed up because uh, a very specific phrase that uh, Porco's narration uses is that he uses uh, the word tombo gaeri, which is literally the translation of how the way a dragonfly turns is. And he uses this term to refer to, we needed to return to the battle after the marriage, like the dragonfly turns, basically. And this is kind of remarkable in the sense that we have this marriage, this happy moment, but immediately the reality comes back, intrudes, and like the dragonfly, which is ephemeral and ephemerality, we kind of go into this and fade away and die in this uh, hellish situation even. And looking at this sky, which we could call like a, an air pilot's Valhalla, right? All the fallen pilots are there. Uh, Porco was thinking that this is kind of hell. Like he was looking at the scene, was describing it as like almost as nightmarish, even though it's like such a sublime encounter even. like this. Yeah, I've also thought yeah. that was very interesting. The, the sort of contrast between having this very beautiful and sublime looking thing where you think, oh, this is like a a hero's paradise, right? This is where you want to go after you die. But on the other hand, having the reality of no, this is actually the sheer volume of the victims of ideology in general, right? Going back to like meta narrative and the, and the first world war, like these yeah, are the victims. Those beautiful lives that loved and had like experiences and, yeah. and like and, lives and ahead of them. Every single all one of away. those is is a person who has their own passions and things, and they're all victims of this ideological battle of like nationalism and stuff like this. So it is not really, and it's so good that that Miyazaki didn't portray it as something outwardly evil because that would be disingenuous it definitely looks very ephemeral and and ideological and and beautiful and sublime but that is exactly the sort of um the sort of switch the sort of um disguise that it makes it's just sort of like the seeming of sublimity and and grandioseness uh while in reality the contrast is the huge, large human cost that it that it brings with it. I think it also ties back well into the the whole th theme we always say with flight and freedom, where Miyazaki said multiple times. I think in some of the interviews for this, in which it's about the film is kind of like about a balancing of freedom and responsibility, and Miyazaki kind of has this very like Japanese belief, that, like saying that. I mean, I think there was one source that was saying that like our concept of freedom is a bit different from the Japanese, and that Miyazaki kind of thinks that you know, all freedom comes with a responsibility. So we have these pilots like forever flying through the sky in like an unlimited sort of freedom. Like they can never be brought down to the earth again. They can just permanently like live in that dreamless flight. But um, in the same sense, they have no responsibilities and there's no like real life there. Like this is an afterlife where they don't have to like be tied to the earth. So that's kind of why it's a hell, because it's uh, an unlimited freedom that you can't really do anything with, that you can't really move on with. It's funny you mentioned freedom in like the context of the movie. I feel like freedom is like a really important theme, like Porco as a agent of like independent, like like masculinity, like freedom versus Curtis, who is a very different but almost similar um, reflection of that, like attempt of like, you know, self-reliance and freedom. It's true American freedom. 
Yeah, and also, like, this is why Gina thinks he's a kid, because he, he wants to become the actor and uh, become president, has all these big dreams and yeah. hopes, and, like, this American dream of becoming great. And she's just like, okay, kid, right. All right, also, a, a good jab against uh, Ron Reagan. Uh, yeah. <laughs> who, who did yeah. achieve that? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure if this is intentional, but, like, on Curtis's plane, he has the it has, it has a rattlesnake, um, and the rattlesnake, of course, in America... In America um, I, I, I'm not, I think this might be intentional, but I'm not sure. It represents like the like the don't tread on me, the like whole libertarian like America like idea of like you know where you, like you as an American you can you can make your own way, you can make you you're, you're free from any like outside world, and you can like make your fortune. Which is especially funny because Curtis is very obviously independent. Like his family is obviously like wealthy, and he's he he, he lives um through he his um his he's, he's, the only reason he can do all these 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 um, games around the Adriatic and like becoming like an actor later is because his his family obviously has so much money. Yeah, I think the the theme of immaturity ties in well because like we say with the ending, it's like Porco and the pirates kind of leaving that world, but Curtis. He goes off to Hollywood to kind of live in this kind of like Tinseltown dreamland that you can imagine that he never grows up in. He kind of stays static in that sense. Yeah. And it's just another example of the sort of ideology and meta narratives that this film attacks, right? It's it's one of the many sort of big ideas of like, oh yeah, this is, we have to be idealistic and have big ideas, big utopian visions, and then we'll get there. It's kind of like a a takedown of them, sometimes lovingly with with the song, and sometimes kind of um, uh, disparagingly um, as to no, this no no no, you just shouldn't do this. As opposed to uh, yes, it, this was very nice and good, but now we have to move on to a different vision of the world. I mean, I feel even Curtis is treated somewhat lovingly in the sense of, of course, like his ideas are shown as naive, but it seems at some to some degree that despite like being this uh, almost like annoyingly smug and like overly masculine presenting like a uh, competing domineering type guy who wants to gain all the women he's kind of presented as like some idealistic naive vision where we can see like yeah i don't know maybe his heart is in the right place but this is just like childish in a sense yeah, yeah like, also, like the pirates um, he's never really shown as a threat because we have yeah. the whole thing where like he's gonna win her in a marriage and like in in a much more serious, darker film, you know, that would imply um, some very nefarious stuff being forced into marriage, and like especially for the time that it's set. But like, it's never seen as a threat. Like Theo never sees Curtis as anything other than like a little boy that she could easily like deal with. Like she wouldn't even I mean, be she's, that afraid she's very to marry scared. him. She she's yeah. kind of scared and shocked of the uh, of the encounter. But like later on, we see that she has a lot of confidence in her plane. And she's not like intimidated yeah. by him in a sense. Yeah, she's she's scared because she just yeah. she's, she's scared of the encounter, not because she's like because she's scared of losing. She's scared because she just put herself out there in front of a bunch of people. I think like she's like presenting herself in front of all these like males with these male like fantasy visions of the world, and like she's like, but that's that's, that's, that's really I, standing up to them. Yeah, that's a discussion yeah. for I think another later. case of soft power, by the way, in the movie, like Gina and like Porco's nonviolence. We have here she uh, solving a conflict where they are like ready to fucking destroy yeah. the airplane and kill Porco. Just she she completely diffuses it by like negotiating yeah. by using charisma by talking. But, but I don't know. But, 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 I, but, I, I still feel that um, Curtis, even though it it may not seem very obvious, that he is seen as one of the very few actual threats in the film. Of like, okay, this is not how we should behave or should do things. Even though he is seen as kind of goofy, ultimately. I don't think that takes away from the sort of harm that he causes in the film. Like he, he also is. What is very notable is that he's the only character that's actually shown, at least implicitly, killing someone. I mean, I don't know if you've missed this, but in the big scene where, um, where yeah, they he attack the, those ace the boat, pilots, uh, the film. yeah, the oh, ace yeah, they, 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 they both survive. It's, it's said explicitly on the radio. Really. Yes. Okay. Then they both, I, they both pair, they both but he definitely used lethal, lethal force. That's that's a, a key yeah, difference yeah. between him Curtis, and Porco. Curtis constantly tries to shoot people. He also tried to kill Porco. Yeah. Like in the final battle, he was shooting to kill. Yeah. Porco yeah. was just too good. Yeah. Um. But, and I think I think it's interesting that these, I think what's most dangerous about dangerous, if you want to say that word, about Curtis is that he is shown like his like self reliance is like masculinity. His self reliance, his idea of like freedom and like 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 worth is defined by his like you know ace pilot status is like 
what that's compared to is Porco constantly. Porco, Porco is, has maybe he's like a better version. He's like he's 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 more suave. He's a better pilot. But in the in the end, he kind of is that same thing. He's that masculine like he's this this is obsessive masculine self reliance where he's like trying to like be holding to no one and live through these like these um he, these hero these war games these hero hero yeah. stories and that, think, and, that, uh, and, that, yeah. and that and that and Curtis implicates Porco in that destructive conception. Yeah. But also Porco is aware it's not a war. Like he literally a line, like when he's buying the ammunition, he's like, no, I don't need the incendiary ammo. I just need the normal one. We're not fighting a war with that kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's why I say war game. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's, a, it's also, a game. And <laughs> yeah. I also think uh, Curtis's um, most important role is like the contrast between not, not only him and Porco, but also uh, he creates a clear contrast between America and Europe, which like for a jab, like, like uh, when it's a, Japanese uh movie about like the the West often like like it it kind of like mixes together but here like there's a clear distinction between the type of romance that Curtis represents and the type that Porco and uh, and Gina represent um and also um and I'm uh, quoting uh I think his name was a uh, Chris Wood uh who who has a text about like the Europeanness uh, how it's represented in uh, Poco Rosso. And he um, mentions how um, um, Poco Rosso, despite the fact that he shares a profession with Curtis, has something which the immature Curtis is not allowed. He has a past. Um, and that's like really uh, a, weight, a, a strong distinction between the Europeans and, and this American. This American who only has all the this future ahead of him and the, just all, all these romantic notions where um where Porco and Gina and like the, the Europeans all have this deep uh past which has formed uh, how they they are in the world uh, to add this complexity that Curtis has yet to develop and, pro- yeah, and pro- I think it's also um a nice structural note that um the two major actors that push the plot along in the film are both from coming from America like Theo she just came back from America and Curtis of course from America and Theo, like Curtis, doesn't really have a past because she's like too young to have a past. So these like fresh Americans kind of come in and change yeah. Europe in this looming sense of war. It's like very. Well, we're on it with like this sense of the adventure flicks because Curtis obviously after the end goes and becomes like an adventure movie actor, while Theo obviously is like inspired by them and wants like to fly with Porco Rosso and be like alongside his hero stories and wants to hear like what he has to say and all this stuff like. There's this sense like this, these Americans kind of have this naivety of when this these bad guy, good guy adventure stories still worked and that something about that, something that is retained specifically in Theo is important. Um, yeah, but like I don't. I would have to say that I don't really agree with the reading of a sort of dichotomy between Europeanness and Americanness as a whole, um, because of course you have the whole looming of fascism on the background. You think maybe what kind of Europeanness is that, and um, kind of painting this sort of culture uh, of, of these pirates as as this specifically European. I think is a bit too overgeneralizing because it also is a sort of very specific culture to the Adriatic, right? You can't go to Germany or like Denmark and, and you won't find the same kind of Europeanness as in that exact area. I think it, to me, it seems way much more of a contrast between uh, a sort of idea of locality and, 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 um, uh, and community over a sort of grandiose ideal of uh, of nationality as well as of na- nationality plays a part in the film. Um, but I think in the same way as it does in Casablanca as a sort of uh, facade here, where we're all like Italians and this and that, but in reality, they are way more of a of a multiplicitous group than just like their their identity as either an Italian or a a European specifically. Well, I think I think it's easy to say that because like if you look at um let's just take a little bit of a step out. If you look at like Miyazaki's movies, um if you look at like um they're set in Europe. Um, you got like uh, Kiki and this and this one specifically. Um, both these movies kind of take place in like a 
over our magical sense, um, Chris Wood talks about this. Uh, this that's kind of what his um, article that you mentioned earlier, Platinum, is about, like this whole idea of like Japanese looking on Europe as this magical space. But if you compare that, say, something like Totoro or something like Spirit Away, they're set in Japan, they have to step out of these um these um the, the normal japanese life into the magical space where like you know like things can happen but like in europe the magical space seems to be all around so i don't know i i think how That's really interesting yeah. I, I i think i think how means like conceives of europe is as this magical space and i think america for him is a little more real in a way it's a little more as you said the rational american and when he talked about the um the um in the, in, in the manga um, so the, I feel like the Americans have to come to Europe to, are, are they kind of like work as like almost like a, the Japanese, like, um, reflection. They like, they're coming to Europe to experience that changed landscape where they can, you know, where magic, where pay, people can become pigs, um, which is a co- another common theme in Miyazaki's work. Yeah. Transformation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I, I think like w- w- one of the core uh, contrasts between, uh, Porco and uh, and Curtis is the the types of uh, individualism they represent. Like uh, Curtis, obviously has that American thing where I am going to do all of these things. I'm going to be uh, a, a, like great, and I'm going to woo these women, and I'm going to do what's like best for me to for fame and fortune. Um, like really individualistic, but at the same time, uh, Porco is also uh, like a s- strongly in- individualistic. He's the only pig in big man in the world and and he he really again and again uh, draws attention to how like that sets him apart from everyone else and that means that oh though these things don't apply to me and uh he, he distances himself from others uh th- that's yeah. a type of individualism in, m- in many um, ways too. But, but that's like, um yeah. yeah like when he's asked in the bank to support the patriot fund and he's like uh pigs aren't people so i'm not i'm not i'm not one <laughs> it's, of it's yours i'm not a patriot i'm not war bonds. the subject of yeah. the nation yeah, yeah. literally asked and, to buy war bonds also a really nice little character design point i noticed is that uh porco like almost pretty much never shows his eyes in the film because we see point. in one shot when he's like washing up in the mirror he has very human-like eyes that are still kind of like reminiscent of how he used to be but he's wearing glasses the entire film and only when they're like punched out of his head at the end of his fight do we kind of see one of them. Yeah, so that's that, kind of like another little like emotional distance from everyone and, else. And that almost yeah, and it's, it seems like that has to do with like his like um transformation as a kind of like expression of like of of of, of survivor guilt because like he wants to hide exactly. every vestige of his humanity because he wants to deny himself of that humanity. That's not he doesn't believe he deserves to be considered almost human in a way he has to be separate from society he has to play these simplistic games because these are the only ways he can conceive of the world himself because he's, he's not he's taken away his humanness in a way it's also, also funny like why would it be specifically a pig right it's like um it's not because it's it's ugly right i don't think it's like a thing uh, he's become ugly because he's still like very popular with women and stuff like this I don't, it's not really something he has to deal with, like with his appearance in the text. I think that's very peculiar that he transformed into a pig, but it's not like, there's not ever a moment where he's like, oh no, my appearance is so bad and stuff like this, right? So the association of pig is here not uh, about the ugliness. I feel like pigs have more like a a bad rap in in European and Western media as like ugly pig or what fat pig or whatever. He's he's a thick boy. He's a thick boy for sure. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But um, in this sense, in Japanese sense, pig is associated as we see in Spirit Away, for example, with like this selfish greed. Yeah. With like this, 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 this impulse. Hedonism, and yes. this is awesome. how Porco sees himself, right? The good guys died, he survived. This is the purest embodiment of like the survivor's guilt that is at play here. The idea that he died and he turned into a pig, someone secluding himself from society. Because honestly, he doesn't think he deserved to survive and he would have rather went up there than the other people. So what what the uh, fascist guy in the cinema says to him, like, hey, come, join the Air Force. You can like, we, I can help you. Uh, to uh, atone for your crimes and so on you can become someone again and then he just says i'd be rather a pig than a fascist which is like the best quote yeah, of the we, entire we, we movie have, anyway yeah it turns out yeah. after that we have no 
literally no choice but to stand a legend he's just yeah. what a fu- what yeah. a fucking legend yep. um but I, I think i think there are a couple other like um things reasons why the pig is the animal he chose the chose the music he chose to transform him into like um the first of those i think is has to do with the cleanliness or perceived lack of cleanliness of pigs um it's like pig, pigs are um are you know they've bad rep for you know being very dirty because they they don't sweat and so they have to wallow in mud to like basically like cool themselves off um but pigs are very like self-consciously like clean like they they always like defecate in like specific spaces um they keep themselves away from other animals etc um and in the movie, you see this several times where cleanliness, um, you see like Fio talks about the pirates. Oh, you're not clean at all. And then they find them really embarrassing and they clean themselves later. And Pokerosa tells you they're not clean. Um, and then but the infants and Kive, um, but it's also used to talk about, you know, pretty in Japanese. Like, like whenever Fio looks, it looks at like comes to Pokerosa's hideout and she looks around and she sees the beautiful Kive, she sees the word she uses. So this like linking of beauty and cleanliness become, I think, important in the conception of Pokerosa as a pig. Um, um, also, I think maybe it was Susan Napier who, who referenced that a you know journey to the West is such like a, a huge cultural oh, yeah. force oh, in I, Asia yeah. that yeah. like the pig character from that it might just be a might be a parallel there as well. Yes, yeah, that's, that's like a sexual thing. That's that's what the association is there. Yeah, like a oolong in Dragon Ball Z. That's yeah. uh, based on that character from Journey to the West. Yeah, They're obviously turned up quite a bit more. Yeah, um, I I think one part that uh, that I think is maybe more important than all these parts is Miyazaki really likes drawing pigs. Oh yeah, <laughs> all true. his little comedic, jokey manga all have pig protagonists. Oh yeah, like like he says himself, he just found it funny to draw pigs in planes. Uh, and, p- and, p- and pig is how he presents, it, he presents himself. Like whenever Miyazaki draws yeah. himself, he's always a pig. By the way, Poco also, um, huge Miyazaki self-insert, yeah, no yeah, question yeah. about it. I actually the thought that Fio was more of a Miyazaki self-insert. Maybe Fio? Both. No, no, that's no. the kind of people Miyazaki admires, like yeah. the young people working at Ghibli. Yeah, Fio, really Fio is very much like uh, Nausicaa in that she is like his idealized, like um, self-acting, self-actualized woman that can kind of like lead the men in the right direction. It's funny how like you talk about um, he, like Fio's butt is meant to be large, which is also like, <laughs> to, 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 to Nasuka, who's always talked about her breasts are large in the manga. And that's like an important yeah. conception of like these like virile women. Um, also, while that comparison is still there uh, in the Nasuka manga that I believe Miyazaki was still Correct. writing part of while doing this, uh, the, when Nasuka becomes like the leader of the worm handlers, it really reminds me of the... Uh, the pirates, the way they mm-hmm. treat um, Theo as kind of like this mother figure who they're all like clamoring yeah. to get the attention of. Yeah. Which is even in their gang name, obviously. Well, mother sex um, figure, because I feel like, you know, these things well, are kind yeah. of related in this where like, you know, Porco, like she sees Porco as a father sex figure as well. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I mean, obviously Porco fucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, he can get it. I mean. Yeah. Yeah, Porco is characterized consistently as this kind of uh, guy the women are interested in, sort of a womanizer, um, sort of sexual. Uh, his, 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 when in the cinema, the fascist guy uh, calls him out on his past misdemeanors and crimes, like his <laughs> pornography and like public uh, indecency. indecency yeah. And all this. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's also quite telling and, and it keys back into the whole immaturity thing that like, he, even though he's kind of this cool womanizer guy, he's like very afraid of Theo and like embarrassed by her like Flustered. kissing him because yeah. he um he kind of knows that she's like a like more adult than him. And it's the same thing with Gina, where like uh, Porco has like left Gina away and kept his distance the whole film and the whole like of their lives because yeah. he's he's too embarrassed. He's too he, too, too he much can a woman make for him. Women really. fall in love with him, but he he can't do anything else. Basically, well, <laughs> I mean, like, he probably well, that depends. He probably um, fucks, but I think it's like <laughs> Rick and Casablanca who fucks. It's clear he fucks. Like he's the the one woman he like sends out of the bar. It's clear he fucked her. Yeah. <laughs> I believe, but he's still there's still a sense of the star-crossed lovers, like the one romance that should not be or couldn't be, like that couldn't happen, and that's Gina for Porco, I believe. Well, honestly, uh, honestly, I think there's um. The, 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 at least the, the Japanese uh, version se- seems like more like a, a charming older gentleman. Um, but if if you listen to the uh, the English dub um, with M- Michael Keaton, uh, the, the scene at the bar where he uh, w- w- when he when he goes off and uh, and uh, w- those women like uh, wooing him and like ooh tell us about the story. Okay, if you listen to Michael Keaton's line reading there, like I'll tell you later when we're alone, that Porco fucks. 
I mean, that's no yeah, fucking doubt. Michael Keaton also does a really great no performance as Porco. I mean, wh- why out. would the Japanese really version cast. not not do that? Like, <laughs> he said the same thing. I mean, the, the, the implication was still there. Yeah, but the yeah. delivery. Um, I, I I think it's interesting to note how um, if you're talking about like you know Porco's like almost removal from sex while engaging in it like constantly like um like you see this like in his like relationship to um um. The, so then the, the flashback scene like where he remembers like where well, Gina remembers him and the, them on the plane together um and like they're they're going driving up like everyone's like happy and then her like her her skirt blows up and he sees and he sees her um her big Miyazaki bloomer underwear um um and it's like um Susan I think Susan Napier who like noted that that or was it was it was it Susan Napier in the article I don't remember um, that noted that it was like um it was um that was like almost like a like safe oh, that, that version was, of sex um, yeah that was a uh, patrick uh, drayson in his uh, oh, yeah. text on, uh, on oh, yeah. S- yeah, sexual yeah. imagery in Pokemon. Yeah. so yeah we're like uh, yeah like yeah. we're the, we're the, the, the this this the um like we're the, like the, the 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 brief view of this like very unsexualized underwear is like this like um this 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 way of accessing sex and you see this later when like feel like takes off like after she like argues with the pirates um and like, she gets like super like nervous and like to to calm herself down she she strips to her her turned away and goes for a swim um and the first time this is expressed is like in the very in the very beginning of the movie with like the the, the young girls and they all when they when when they when they like take off their clothes when they get it gets wet when they go swimming it's like I feel like women's underwear is an important like image in these like kind of like um um conception of um like this like masculine like self reliance but like this this inaccessibility of sex in a way. Um, I, I think also that uh, that scene and um, and it's it's pointed out in the the, the paper you were talking about. Um, th- that's another way that uh, flight is used in Miyazaki films, which uh, I remember I talked about way back in the first episode in uh, about Nausicaa. Uh, it it can mean it means so many different things, like uh, freedom, obviously, uh, like d- dreaming, uh, but also like d- uh, desire, also war. But in this case, it's also like intimacy. Like yeah. when when characters fly together, that's uh, that that's a sign of intimacy, even for like underage characters, like uh, for instance in uh, Laputa. Um, so, so like it, in that way, like it's a shorthand in that flashback um, for like th- this moment where they had this intimate connection with each other, uh, yeah. flying oh, together. Yeah. Um, if we're talking about um, that scene with Porco and Gina as children, I think it's interesting and maybe good to move on to just analyzing Gina as a character. Because I found her quite interesting. Yeah, because spe- uh, speaking of characters who let can me get see. it. Yeah, I agree. But let me qu- quickly check the boxes. So Porco turns into a pig because of sense of survivor's guilt, seclusion from society, not really wanting to belong anymore, like a sense of individualism. Um, the He hides on this secluded island, uh, isolates himself from society. So we captured uh, what Porco is and who he is, and that he cannot like really sexually or lovingly embrace like Gina. And uh, just making sure that we caught everything. I, I, we caught everything. I, 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 I remembered on this what I was gonna say. Um, I think, yeah. Can I say it real quick? Yes. Um, so like, Go for so it. when the when when Gina's first singing the song, like in the, the bar where like, you know Curtis is trying to get everyone quiet, so he, like because he's trying to show off how like, cool it is that he's like listening to the woman. Um, you see, like the um, when the the song goes on, it's it it shifts away. Um, from the bar to Porco's plane coming in, and like in this like really lyrical sequence of him landing his plane and getting out and coming it's to, so into gorgeous. the bar. It's so gorgeous. And it's like as you when you talk about the the whole using in, like um plane as intimacy, it's like like his like flying in is like a like is a is a it's like almost like a conversation. It's like a love song between them. His flight versus her singing. And I thought that was really like beautiful and interesting. Yeah, and that I mean and in that this also context returns, we can also bring up the scene where when he returns from Milano, exactly. when he does the stunts he has fear on board but he's like doing these crazy loopings yeah. in front of uh, yeah. uh gina to that's show like off, that's basically. like one of my favorite scenes the whole movie the way the mu- the music uh like arrives at the same time as gina oh yeah hears, the music was so ride. good there and yeah. and then when he when he's when he starts his, his flight he goes down at the wa- uh, at the water level and then rises vertically into the sky as the music suddenly rises a bit up it's just so beautiful yeah. and then it gets into this whole like the whole orchestra get, gets in on it as she has this flashback to this uh moment of innocent uh intimacy yeah. in their youth which um also ret- this exact uh, musical uh, sequence this motif returns uh, like at the end of the movie, when uh, she uh, w- when she comes and uh, rescues them away from uh, b- before yeah. the fascists can arrive. 
And that's also it's also, it's also like you to, it's, it's important to note that like that scene like she's waiting in her garden like as she said like to, to Curtis like she's waiting for Porco to come and she'll marry him if he he comes during the the day but she he always, he always comes at night. Um, and but like and, and he comes he, like, he comes like in that time he comes during the day it's close to the garden like he's almost like he's like brushing with that sex like I mean garden of course is like can serve as like a sexual metaphor in a lot of ways like she's tending her garden she wants someone to come you know, it's a domesticated area where like she wants like to tame the wild pork in a way but um um it's almost like they're flirting with sex and i, I think it begs the question like why is it that Porco, if we assume that he fucks why is it that he's so like distant from a like romantic sexuality like why is he always like doing it from like like why is he always like he's like glimpses yeah. of other women's underwear why is it like why is he using like these like metaphor of flight why isn't he just you know he's why isn't he claiming this i think that's important well again i think it i think it all ties into his immaturity like uh porco he, yeah, he he might he might he may have sex with just like you know random like floozies who are there, but like he can never like really connect, and he's very intimidated clearly by Theo and possibly Gina. Yeah, because he, um again, it's about accepting his humanity and about him willing to uh to go back to how he was as a man, but he's he's too con yeah. he's too um he's too content to be immature and live as a child, which I think also in a way kind of reflects on Gina a little bit where she's still living here waiting for Porco. She has yet to move on with her life. She's still kind of yeah. um, circling around in this immature fantasy where he'll come and visit her in the garden like a, like a romantic hero. And I think that's why Theo, who's much younger and like not at all jaded like Porco or Gina is injected into the plot and allows them, the two of them to move on. Yeah. I think that's true. I think it's also a, uh... There's also a bit simpler an explanation, uh, which which comes back in in the first. It's that he he kind of has a sort of a living in the moment attitude that can like make him die at any moment, basically, right? He's like he's on such like a hedonistic living day to day kind of mindset that he kind of figures himself to that he doesn't value his own life anymore, and he's also like lives pretty dangerously so yeah he doesn't yeah, feel like to the guilt yeah, he, exactly. can the guilt be, be, he lives day to day and yeah. dangerously because he feels like she he should have died that day instead of his friend bellini who had just yeah. married gina he does not think he can in a sense replace bellini he wanted to die himself and so that gina wouldn't because be alone. Of because that, he loved gina obviously since that since back then even but yeah, he and does not feel like he could it doesn't feel deserving yeah, and it's also that, you know, uh, Gina also said before that she's lost, like, three husbands uh, before. All pilots. Yeah, all pilots. So he doesn't want to be that same person that's just going to die. You, you see in the movie, like, he smokes like a like a lunatic. He drinks, like, a <laughs> lot, like a ton. Like, <laughs> yeah. he doesn't really care about, like, getting back into, like... A, a a joyous uh fulfilling life he just wants to like yeah uh be a hedonistic bastard in and, and one of the interviews as well another another part that i really like where mizaki talked about this uh, the interviewer asked isn't the idea of a single survivor turning into a pick after everyone else is dead isn't that expressing a kind of self-punishment and Miyazaki answers well yes but it's not exactly because he's the only one left the problem is that he is flying also, a Gina marrying three other um, pilots um, almost definitely seems like a, an illusion that she's just trying to fill um, fill in the space that Porco's left. Like she, he, he hasn't married her, so she's just found a, a surrogate pilot. Well, I, I don't know if that was the implication. I, I mean, there is a sense of that because the uh, the first framing, as I understand it, is that Bellini and Porco were both in competition kind of around Gina and he became the best man on the marriage because like Bellini kind of won this con conflict. And since then, he was not able to like be there for Gina or like allow himself to embrace this love to Gina that he felt. And that in the meantime, well, obviously, like she, uh, like, a, like a normal person would be, you have different loves in your life and yeah. your life goes on. You have to keep on living. Yeah. It is just Porco who isolated himself into this almost womb-like, uh, secluded, like, area on this island, this little beach, which is, like, completely enshrined by high walls where he can, like, sit in his uh, lawn chair and, and listen to the radio while drinking wine. From from that regard, like, Porco Rose is almost a, like a sexual fan failure like he lo he lost he lost the comp the, the, the like masculine competition for gina when he was young and like 
and the guy who is better than him, the, the I mean, like the guy is almost serves as like the version of Porco who that that as Porco should have been, but he should have died. Um, succeeded and like and like won the hand of Gina. And I think from Porco's perspective, that's that's almost like he's already failed in his like sexual role, and so like he can't he can't access it in a real way. Well, I, th- I think it's, it's even stronger this sense of inadequacy, uh, w- yeah. which like w- which might already have been like part of. Uh, him when uh, Gina got married to his friend, but I really became something that haunted him and defined him after uh, after his uh, squ- all, his whole squadron died, um, yeah. and uh, and and that's like and that's exactly why his entire like character arc is like uh, the the end of it is just accepting that Gina is actually in love with him. And that yeah. it's it's as simple as that. But it's, it's this idea that not only. Are you like like is is it okay for you to live, but you're you're loved, you're valuable to to someone? Uh, I, th- I think that's a really uh, beautiful sentiment. Um, yeah. But like also uh, someone who also helps him uh, regain his faith in humanity, which he literally says uh, like like uh, Theo, she's a really like important catalyst for this. Um, for like uh, it's it's the classic dynamic of like the the old the the the, the old. Uh, and um, c- c- kind of wise and but also cynical uh, uh, master and the uh, and 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 the young like uh, apprentice sidekick that helps them see like f- regain their optimism. It's also the reason why I don't think that like the the, the whole thing with like as the, the so sexual thing with Theo with uh, her being like an object of desire for all these pirates and uh, and 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 all the, these this back and forth joking where like. Porco's very aware that she's like a young woman and they shouldn't like be around each other and her like ignoring it. I, I think it's like just perfectly innocent. It does it never like to me reads like creepy in any way. I mean it 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 was mostly like Theo being the instigator, right? And it, I think it's pretty clear that Theo really likes Porco. Oh, yeah, she she has a, like, a, like a, a but not crush. like in a healthy way. Like <laughs> no, she, yeah. has, she has she's a crush idolizing like yeah. the hero pig. Yeah, and, and, yeah. She, and she always compares them, oh like her father told her like, lots of stories because her, her father like flew with Porco. Um and so like his, and so she like really like strongly associates him with her father. And so like and she like like you go there's a scene where like the scene where she kisses him on the cheek um he she she she, she that, that was right after him her, her asking um him to tell her a bedtime story. Um so it's very clear that this like this father, yeah. he, he's serving this, this sort of father paternal, her. Yeah. yeah yeah it's very psychoanalytical like um it's very obvious that she like like she, like she even suggests that they kiss like it, it, she obviously wants to get it on you know but like um yeah the fairy tale kiss though right yeah. the you are cursed you're transformed maybe a kiss from a young maiden will transform you back like this this adherence not only to the adventure stories but also like the old hero stories of like fairy tales and such it's very like her her attraction is very mythical. It's not really based on like an actual human yeah. connection. It's, it's very it, mythical. Yeah, and it, it ties in the theme generally of the movie of like taking sexuality and making it innocent, which I think is important because I think because as we see it so earlier, like sexuality is tied to like this like you know all the expressive ideas expressed through the plane and through the um the song that that that's like you know linked to like com- like um the like the the um the Paris Commune and so like all these like. It's like taking all of these different like complicated ideas of sexuality and politics and um and like meta and, like 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 and, and like um storytelling and like trying to like it, 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 it's it's like draping them with this like this like like soft like innocence I think yeah and I think yeah Theo's uninhibitedness is just again like one of the the key things about her that like makes her stand out in the way that yeah she'll just willingly like kiss Porco multiple times. She just strips off and runs into the ocean like she doesn't care about it, talking about her, how wide her hips are. Um, she, she doesn't carry any kind of baggage with sexuality like the other characters do. I don't think this comes from a sort of place of naivete. I think this is a deliberate assertion of her sexuality and an assertion of her attraction to Porco. I don't think she would like do this like in any situation. Um, yeah, that's that might be true, but again, the fact that she's so open around him is like oh, um, yeah. her uh, and I mean, factor yeah. there. I By the end, Porco picks her literally up and like shucks her in the yeah. airplane. <laughs> you go with <laughs> Gina. You don't, you're not coming with me. Which is exactly the same as how of how um how um Casablanca ends. <laughs> yeah, basically, <laughs> kind of, kind of like Casablanca was like uh, it, it, Casablanca was all like giving up that for for something greater. 
uh, well, and more I mean, important to both of them. Custom Monkey, which, he, he robs her agency. In this one, I don't think he does rob her agency. Uh, also, like Casablanca, we get a little neat bit where the two of them, uh, him and uh, Curtis, are like, let's go off and fly and get the fascists' uh, uh, attention so the rest of them can right, make the way. Yeah, they have Almost like the, this is going to be a beautiful friendship moment. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I I think um, getting back to the whole like like the, this naivete and straightforwardness, like uh, I think the word we're dancing around is romance, and not just like romance as like uh, yeah you know uh, love, but also like the capital R romance, which like yeah. which is just in every single frame of this goddamn movie. Um, just uh, the, the how uh, Porco acts is like he's this classic romantic. Uh, it's, it's that type of like a uh, kind of mis- misogyny with like uh, whoa a, a lady being a b- building my plane a lady going along with me for like a journey just the two of us no thank you that's won't be safe th- 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 that's the type of romance. a lady mechanic what <laughs> yeah exactly um, and like Gina she also has this this romance to her but but like the, also the tragic romance of. Uh, lost love and uh, lost opportunities and uh, and uh, death, but also like this hope for uh, for for this man to take to make that big gesture to her, like like waiting for someone. That's a de- definitely a type of romance. And Theo has that whole thing with the story she really really loves and really truly believes in. She she's like she might actually be like the purest most idealistic romantic in the in the film. Even maybe even more than uh, than Curtis, who like as we discussed, also has this very Hollywood American individualistic idea of romance that doesn't really involve others. And while we're on Theo, I think the best uh, thing to talk about in her context, like the thing that surprised Porco the most, which I alluded to, is that she's a mechanic. And also that the Piccolo uh, uh, airplane shop that Porco is like a patron of is entirely run by women right now. And I found this to be an interesting parallel. So we obviously talked about Miyazaki's relationship to female workers at Studio Ghibli in the Kiki cast already. Just to give a quick brief recap, at the time of Porco Rosso, there was like this huge restructuring and renovating and rebuilding of the studio, of the Ghibli studio where Miyazaki was like taking huge part in all of the designing of the building and like put grass on the roof of it to be like more, more eco-friendly. And he was, uh, uh, and apparently uh, Susan Napier brings this up during the uh, making of Porco Rosso. He was also dealing with it with a question because he wanted to uh, create like the most amazing women's bathroom for all his female employees because he was like that he wanted to give these women that worked uh, under him that were so impressed by a space uh, uh, where they could take a break from the intense demands of making animation. So what he is covering in this film is like, if we take Porco as like a self-insert, we can see he has to like, oh shit, women working on this? Then seeing, oh my god, these women are really good. And then fuck, they did something much better than I would have expected. He has kind of come to come to term with like these this old sexes and this old anticipation of like women at the workplace. And they're now entering the workforce and they're really good. They're really good and diligent and extremely successful. And Porco is like kind of like, yeah, has to see that and come to learn that. And I think that's a very interesting also like kind of labor utopia we see in this this shop, right? They're all working passionately on this uh, thing, on these fancy airplanes, which nobody else really does. Like it's not, it's all very individualized labor. Fio can really realize her own vision and ideas of what kind of plane to make. And everything is like kind of this unalienated labor that uh, Miyazaki talks also in starting point about this film. Um, that he says, like, I think that the whole film really reflected the fact that to me, passion and effort are what working is all about. And that constructing these aesthetic, but uh, this is my part, constructing aesthetic but impractical planes is kind of like this unalienated labor, something to be passionate about where you actually have a job where you don't feel like killing yourself. Like we talk about similar ideas in Kiki as well, uh, but this is returning here, this idea. And also like if, if, uh, if if the metaphor of uh, building a plane to uh, uh, making an animation film wasn't ob- obviously enough with, uh, you know, the the uh, grandpa as like a producer, uh, Porco as financier, um, Theo as director, then we also have like the, the engine is literally G- Ghibli. Um, which we, we talked about. I mean, it the, says, yeah, it yeah. says it on the engine. It says Ghibli on it, yeah. yeah which is be, because, like, uh, Studio Ghibli is named after this airplane engine, which was named after this specific type of desert wind, uh, which uh, we, we mentioned it uh, in, in the first episode of the cast. But 
I, I just they're literally it's literally about these working women helping Ghibli fly. I mean, come on. Uh, also, even adding on to that metaphor, I think it's really nice how all the uh, the seaplanes we see in the film, including Porco's, are all these ridiculous, fun, colorful, d- weird designs that don't even really work in reality. But then we noticed all the fascist planes are like the exact same mass-produced, or same color, uh, normal-looking seaplane that's completely like a uh, devoid of creativity. Yeah. Yeah, in comparison to the wild pirate airships, which are all like stupid looking and weirdly designed and have dumb engines and, and like and polka dots everywhere. on them, yeah. 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 I, I think I I I think that the, the whole idea of like misogyny doesn't just refer to like, you know, um him like the Mizaki dealing with women in the world, but I think I think it's really important, like I think profoundly like, um implications in the movie itself. Like in the very beginning yeah. scene, right? Like where like Poker is playing his like his like his the war games with the pirates, um, and he saves all the girls. Like it's it's exactly how this 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 is how the traditional masculine conception should be. Like the, the, yeah. the hero, the male hero, but the male villains save the girls from the villain. Um, but then you, and you go and, and you go later. Like look, look at the scene with Curtis, um, with the, and the Gina singing the song. Curtis is like almost violently enforcing this like this the, the, um a quiet so that the um, the song can play. He's like shushing the other pirates when the reporters are like um, interviewing Porco loudly. He t- picks them up and he shoves them to a sheet, and it's like it's quite like expressly animated and like how like you can hear like the sound of them like being pushed into the chair, and you see like how like. How it, it was, it was painful for them. Um, and he immediately, he immediately, like Curtis immediately, like, um, um, declares his love for, um, Gina and then later Theo when he notices her. It's kind of funny, like, how he doesn't notice her at first. But the moment he knows she's a girl, she, he, the only way he can relate to women is through this sexual conception. Um, and then I also like how do you I say smell that, a female uh, the, girl. <laughs> I also like how you say that the traditional hero narrative is that the male hero saved the girl and the male uh, villain like takes the girl. I think I think find it interesting that Curtis kind of enforces the situation by the end when like the Theo situation arises and he's like, okay, but if you have a duel, then I need some stakes. I will marry the girl. Yeah. And he kind of like makes this whole masculine chauvinistic like finale out of it with devolving into fist fight. And it's interesting how in this movie, like the people who actually save people are the women. Gina is coming to save them basically from the fascists. Theo's coming to Porco to save him from himself in yeah. a sense. And, and it's really interesting, like when you go to the scene with like where Porco's like gets his, he's really like, oh, when he hears that, oh, like a young girl's gonna make his plane, he like starts like putting the money back and then like and then and then, then, then like they convince him. Um and like he's like pulled along like the way. Like when he finds that all the factory workers are women, he's like getting so like flustered. Um, even like the old women from the town who like he has like a relationship with. Like he definitely respects them as human beings, but he definitely has this, like, he definitely, like, looks, has a kind of looking down on them because, you know, they're women. Um, and, like, you see the scene where he's, like, at the factory watching his plane getting built and all these people working, and he's rocking a baby. Um, and oh, this, yeah. this scene is yeah, incredible. because like, this, this, So, like, so this, this I, I don't think it's just a great little thing. I think it's the most important scene in the movie. Um, because, like, this whole conception of the movie is, like, Porco Rosso is, like, in this nostalgic state where he's have to, he's, like, he's doing this, uh, he's living through the old, like, conception of fairy tales and men saving women and dog fights and masculine self-reliance and all these things. But, like, but then you get to the scene where, like, his, um, his, the, his plane, the vehicle through which he can express himself, like the art object of the movie, um, is being built in front of him, and he is he can't do anything. All the women are like doing all the creative and and um, manual roles, where he's just sitting there rocking the baby, like the good um, domestic figure. And it's it's it. I, that scene is incredible in this regard because I think it really talks to how the movie is taking apart these ideas of nostalgia and um and um and and um. Um, narratives of hero stories and masculinity and like putting them in the, like this new interesting context yeah and i think that that's really done and best f- um framed by the the little cartoon movie we see when mm-hmm. that he's watching in the cinema where it's like I, this oh, very yeah. straightforward hero story there's the evil pig kidnapping the woman then the uh yeah. i think he's like a mouse or whatever comes and saves her and then there's like a big kiss at the end yeah like and, it's uh, basically like a, a mickey mouse of a uh, <laughs> fetus and cat figure kissing betty boop um but also, it's so remarkable. Porco says, "Wow, this is a shit film," yeah, or something like exactly. this. And the fascist, like just a minute later, "Oh, this is a good film." Yeah, yeah. good film. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, we fresh, like yeah. it. When, <laughs> yeah, that confuses me. No, no, that confuses uh, me. I think it's, it's it's a great bit of uh, characterization for Porco because he he dislikes it because it it has that straightforward and the the hero gets the girl at the end and yeah. uh, and but uh, the 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 fascist likes it. That's how yeah. the world works. There's this certainty. Uh, that, yeah. that Porco doesn't have. I think it's a great And, and I think it's very telling how the film ends uh, differently from this because we get quite the ridiculous scene of the bet 
and we even get a shot that's like so purposely stupid and misogynistic that it was done intentionally like where it's on one chair is a big sack with a dollar sign on it (laughs) Theo is in the other chair and it's like these are the same um, possession you know but then in the end yeah like we say Gina comes and she saves everyone and then it's um Theo who reaches out to kiss Porco so it's like a, a complete role reversal and like um, yeah. taking apart the traditional as the narrative. men impotently yeah. are striking it's, out it's, at each other it's yeah. like amazing it's like it's, it's almost like this, this is emasculation but like this like celebration of emasculation in this way which i think is really cool was it i don't know i don't know if that was the case but it definitely is the case i think like if you go to yeah, this last scene like them like they, they have this like you know this this beautiful fight and then their their guns jam because like <laughs> of course the guns jam like it's it's yeah. they, can't, they can't hurt each other and it's because like there's this masculine this masculine like war stories is like these are these are these are ridiculous and stupid so they have to land their planes and they start wailing each other for like it's like like five ten minutes of just them smacking each other and like they're the I, faces I, I all love purple. How <laughs> like the guns jam that means the pain is <laughs> yeah exactly it's exactly there <laughs> exactly i also love how we have this this um when, when they, they they start uh the fist fight then we have a cut to uh to gina uh on, on that uh spy radio um like like yeah. uh, like tracking the movements of uh, of the um the italian the fascist police and uh and, and th- then she she goes off to warn them and then we cut back and everyone has imp- have improvised a boxing match yeah, <laughs> yeah like yeah, a yeah. Chairs, gong and rounds of referee the ocean. <laughs> It's, it's this so utter hilarious. mockery of like this, like you know, the, oh, this, this, these masculine characters have a fight for the woman and the money, and like it's like, uh, I, 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 and it's just, it's so ridiculous. So yeah, that it, it, it's nothing. It's, it's, it's mocking it, like, like it's, 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 it's a failure. There's no, there's this, this, this masculinity, this like self reliance, it doesn't work. It's, it's, it's ridiculous and 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 it's just a stupid game. And that's I love also how when we have that. this, uh, we have this amazing shot when uh, when Gina arrives and her uh, and her seaplane just like gets into the middle of the ring. And the referee's like, whoa, 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 and uh, and like she's just like, what the fuck are you doing? Uh, get get yeah. up, come yeah. on! Yeah, the, the plane, and the plane like, like right before, like like it's stop, it almost like the, the plane like, almost runs them over, and like just stop right before. And she's like looking down, like and, like she's like they're like laying down on the ground. She's looking down on them. I love like the the, the like you know visual power like metaphor there. It's so, like <laughs> like Gina always is like Gina and Theo are the, the, the prime movers in this movie. Like Gina controls, like she controls the try some soft power. She controls, like she stops the violence, and then Theo is the great cre- creator. Um, where these male you're also a soft paw by the way yeah. though like ushering in this final scene yeah. offering herself basically up as uh, like uh, yeah. the the bad object also like she, she could be a gang leader if she wanted to um that's actually a good point um i just thought of now is that um i was kind of mistaken earlier when i was saying the prime actors in the film were theo and curtis because actually curtis doesn't do anything in in a yeah. sense, because he goes after Porco, but then he doesn't get a single shot off on Porco. Porco's own engine fails, yeah. and that's like <laughs> what kind of causes it. So Curtis doesn't even get that kind of victory over him. It's like a mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and we have this this sort of this honor that's so important to, to these ro- romantic heroes yeah. that like, no, you you didn't actually win. It, it was just my engine that, uh, and we need yeah. to like prove who's really best. Uh, but then the stupid bet is resolved because. With all the little fun they're having in the emasculated battle of masculinity, uh, the fascists are coming. Yeah. We're getting fucked. Yeah. yeah this, all, all these, all all these the romantic ideas, the world, like, yeah. Yeah, it's, de- it's dead. Like, there's, there's no there's no future for it. Like, it, I mean, there is a future for it in a way, um, but, like, it, it, you have to, like, like the, I, 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 I'm a little confused by the ending, because I, I wonder, like, so you, you have this emasculated like, journey, like, you have this thing, but then, okay, the fascists are coming, so, so it's, like, it all is the end. But I... I I, I I wonder. I I, I want to ask you guys. Like, what what do you guys think? Well, what do you? How do you guys make that like transformation? So, like, do you think like the meta narratives are are like you know shown to be like destructive, and so we should take them apart, or are they like so, like made fun of? Like, I, I believe. I, yeah. I don't think it's um, as much about masculinity yeah. as it is about this roman these romantic notions. Well, this innocence. Oh, I, I, yeah. masculinity yeah. as masculinity is a metaphor for like you know traditional hero stories. I believe here we return to the Casablanca comparison because in the end you have this brilliant exchange in Casablanca where the French uh, uh, officer Renault is like, oh, so you are still a sentimentalist. And Rick is like, well, P.S. I am. And Renault's like, I'm also a sentimentalist. <laughs> and like they, they go away together. And I feel like kind of this is what it is, right? The Despite like the oncoming Nazis and fascists in Porco Rosso and despite like their uh, ideal rom- uh, romance driven, like uh, the emasculated masculine fight, there, there is still an important thing. And we want to retain like some kernel of this goodness that we assume to be in our existence and ourselves as the side of point of resistance that we 
well, despite having like these show matches that are ultimately like really fruitless and like really uh, performances of like a long gone past, there's still the fascists. And uh, I think when Theo kisses Porco and Porco just realizes kind of uh, his position he is in now, what he has just done, what kind of like romance he uh, uh, summoned back forth into his life and for what cause he just uh, acted and what new cause he has with now was together with Curtis, like diverting the fascists. I think this is the same moment how also Rick realizes there is a cause and I can defend people against fascism and I can do the right thing. And this is kind of born in a healthy way out of uh, a, a mature take on these romantic ideals. Um, I think that's true. The way I really read the ending was that... um. Um, we we have this very kind of personal journey for Miyazaki where the film started out initially as like a, a fun little project of just like planes and pigs and adventure. But as the world changed around Miyazaki and like he kind of became a bit jaded to things, he changed it into a more emotionally developed film. And in the ending, I think it's left just very vague and open because of like Miyazaki's feelings that like, yeah, there is this tidal wave of fascism that we know is World War II coming in the film world. And in our world, we know that there's these kind of um, events and these like ethnic cleansings will continue to happen and bad things will just keep on coming. And we kind of have to just accept that that will happen, but like still mature from it. So we don't get a conclusive ending to any of the story bits. There's the left open garden thing. Did Porco go to see Gina? Not 100% confirmed, but it's it's still a glimmer of hope. And that's well, really so, yeah, the... So, uh, well, well, before, okay, before yeah, we talk about that part of the ending... Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because like, um, so like, aside from like, I I think the whole like <laughs> fist fight at the end is is just like this this last vestige of uh, again this uh the, the, all these romantic notions that uh that like are, are fading away like it, it's it's very much uh, a movie about like <sighs> the, the yearning for this uh the, the, this adventure that like can't go on uh mm. and can't be returned to. Um, uh, I, there's still a bunch of like smaller things in the film I want to talk about before we really get into the ending. Uh, if that's okay, like if any of you have yeah, anything, totally. uh, this, oh, yeah, this is a great time as well. So, um, I just like first of all, I just want to talk about how gorgeous this movie is. Like, um, like you obviously have the landscapes, which and and the skyscapes, with uh, seascapes, and all 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 the scapes, which are just absolutely phenomenal uh like the the sunsets the uh the clouds uh, above like how the clouds become their own three-dimensional landscape during the, uh, the the dog fights i don't think there's a clear sky in the entire movie aside from uh the uh valhalla uh sequence um and and just how lovingly detailed like th this animated film has excellent production design like <laughs> it's it, it's set design. It's, it's just so weird. Like, like like every single like building and interior uh, and, and and exterior is just like filled with like personality and wear and uh, and authenticity. There's clearly been a lot of location scouting when uh, when making this uh, this movie. Um, and, and I don't yeah. know if you said it during the podcast or before when we were talking, but Miyazaki insisted on doing all the key animation for all of the flight sequences himself. Exactly, yeah. and it the, shows... All the plane shots in this are amazing. I'm, I'm willing to bet Anno was very jelly that he didn't get to work on this <laughs> one. He didn't get any two key frames for this. Yeah, but, uh, and like, um, so, and, and this is something that I only really, like, truly appreciated, like, I think third time I watched it or something. Like, almost every single plane sequence has at least one shot of the plane moving away from or towards the camera, uh often a complex motion which uh, we've talked about uh, in, in uh, the previous episode like that's really 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 difficult to do with 2d animation especially traditional 2d animation mm. like holy th there's like if you look out for them there's just this holy shit shot in like every single <laughs> uh, aerial sequence it's phenomenal and and like done in a way where you barely even notice it and if if if, yeah. if we're on the the, the the um the the subject of of like animation, um, I think like you look at like um Fio's animation specifically like when she like is first like um like trying to convince Porco de Lara to um to um to um to um, make his plane, like it's really fascinating how much like I feel like this movie like the first one that like 
like Miyazaki movies always like have like a lot of like 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 movement like expression, but like facial expression is like I, I feel like it's almost like inspired by um the last uh, movie that was on this podcast, wait, um the, the Blake in the name um o- only yesterday only yesterday like there's a lot more complexity and like like almost realism and like certain like facial movements where like they'll be thinking for a second and then they'll move into smiling and then like be like pull back and I don't know it's, it's, I loved how like the um the facial expressions were done in this movie specifically of Theo. Uh, I think well. Porco also gets a lot of real good uh, expressions throughout the film. Mm. His yeah. uh, yes, big it, pig it, face really lends yes. itself to some when of, he like, laughs and, and you can see his yeah. whole body vibrating with laughter. Yeah. It's so, and so he, good. And he crunches, scrunches up his face like when Fia was like worked up all night. Worked all night. And he's like, oh, what, and I have one condition: you just don't, don't, don't spend all night working. And it's like I love how his face like scrunches up and he gets like this annoyed face. It's great. Yeah, and on that topic of that scene, I think Platon, you wrote something yeah, yesterday yes, yeah. so, uh, um, when you're watching it. Yeah, it's it's just a little bit of excellent uh, di- uh, directing. Uh, it's uh, th- the morning uh, after uh, Porco arrives at uh, the uh, uh, Piccolo family's uh, workshop, um, where we, we we have the shot of uh, Porco washing his face, and we see uh, it's it's kind of dark, so so it's like early morning. Uh, pretty clearly established that way and um and we we see in the background a boat going uh uh down the canal uh behind the window uh then we cut to uh first a close up of uh uh, so, uh riding uh because it's a few riding these designs and we we see a shot of her workspace where the sound of the boat arrives and it come and it, it arrives as well going the same direction uh, we see through the window at the same time we see behind her uh on a table uh coffee uh, uh like in a, in a coffee cup and we she yawns and stretches we immediately know like everything we need to know about the situation it's morning they've uh, they've got a view of the canal uh Porco had just gotten up few's been up all night designing like and and it takes like fifteen or so seconds. It, it's those kinds of details that uh, are the mark of a, like a great director, not just the big flashy sequences. Yeah. Um. There's actually another one I, I wanted to highlight as well. It's um the scene when Porco arrives uh at uh at, at the hotel uh while Regina is singing. We get this um this great contrast uh between uh we see Porco arriving. Um, and his surroundings, especially like the walls, uh, they, they have like paintings. There's a propeller on one of them. There's a framed um, n- newspaper clipping. Uh, there's a plant that is really like kind of elegant and high class. Uh, and we cut to the pirate table, which are obviously in a shady corner. And we see the, their background is a brick wall filled with like all these um, paper clippings just plastered all over the place. There's a great contrast there between this suave gentleman who's just arrived at a fa- uh, a great fancy establishment and this shady corner filled with <laughs> you know the, the, those types of guys the, the, again like the set and production design is just really 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 good there's a, there's a ton of those kinds of uh, moments in the in, in the film that it's, it's those kinds of details i love returning to uh ghibli works to uh, to notice so i suppose that uh leaves us uh to return to the ending right uh, I actually want to mention something at the very, very, very beginning. The movie begins like at like at the very start with this typewriter noise as we see this uh, like sort of news bulletin esque text cr- uh, crawl across the screen to explain where we are and who our hero is, and it's done in, oh, yeah, all, in all different languages, in all languages yeah. at once. So this, as like, far as I understand, that's because of the airplane, because it also had very early, like an airplane dub, and like was shown at airplanes long before it was shown in the cinema. Yeah, like, exactly. That's thing. exactly right. But it's also, I, th- I think, it also like establishes genre really well. Like it, it establishes time because we have this typewriter noise, um, uh, and it establishes like a uh, place as like this international space, you know, where different. Yeah. Uh, N- nations are interested in this story and also it's while kind of- flying fuck that's a good yeah. one actually yeah. like this movie is supposed to be in a liminal space because it is a movie about liminal time and space and it's for people like older businessmen who are worn out from work Im- still it is still for them like it is yeah in a way but also this, this it also makes it very um, interesting it, it, it's also a genre touch like it goes back to these like old adventure serials uh uh, which like it's also the reason Star Wars has this text crawl at the beginning of it, 
uh, uh, or, or, or like it even goes back to like silent pictures, uh, which I mean, needed literally those to Casablanca had an opening with a world map where they like drew the lines and explained like the refugee trail from yeah. Paris to uh, uh, Casablanca. Yeah, exactly. That's the, that's uh, all sorts of stuff going on just in the in like the way it introduces the story. Um, and yeah, the, the the film is like the the, the landscapes uh, in this film, especially when they. There's this amazing shot um, when um, after the uh, the takeoff uh, in the Milano, the, the channels of Mi- Milano, which is just all timer, just the, the the animation, the direction in, in when they uh, when they fly, uh, don't fly, but like, like uh, sail along the canal, uh, gaining speed, uh, like the, the physicality and the, the the motion of that sequence is just brilliant. But even like afterwards. After uh, his uh, old friend from the Italian Air Force uh, helps them evade uh, capture, there's this one specific shot where we see um, where the landscape just rushes past us b- below the plane uh, as as he gets out to open sea, and it's just insane. Like we we see like a, a group of sheep, like like just for half a second, and it's kind of a blur, but you can kind of also pause. The, the movie there and see the individual sheep. It's crazy. God, this movie's well animated. Yeah. It really is. Like, especially animated backgrounds are, like, a huge thing. Because, like, think about, like, usually you have, like, static backgrounds, which highly limits the way in which anime cinematography goes, yeah, where maybe, you have, like, with, a, with a, a, bit of a, a moving object in a, like a, in front of like a static or parallax background yes but animated backdrops means you don't have like usual painterly backdrops but like keyframes for literally every like minute change in the landscape for every perspective shift and it's absolutely crazy yeah yeah but this is also like a, a general kind of miyazaki thing right i don't i don't think there's a single miyazaki film where he doesn't like do some crazy yeah. animated background the cat shit. Bus, for example yeah, yeah. The next movie is going to be even more impressive in that regard. In Princess Mononoke. Oh, Jesus. He's, oh, yeah. yeah, he's, finally, he's finally uninhibited because yeah. he can use the, the, the um, computer yeah. animation and just goes wild. <laughs> yeah, but Porco feels like the most like um, like passively impressive thing Miyazaki's ever done. Where it's like, there's no like moments of like, like Sakuga in the traditional sense. It's just yeah, but you everything have to looks it. so good all the time. Yeah. It's, yeah. All, it's all about yeah. the craftsmanship, right? It's uh, yeah. not, not about the big movie. It's, it's about like the way that. Like, yeah, again, it's it's subtly I- impressive. Like, as, but as soon as you start like really uh, taking notice of those moments, then you it's just s- such a wealth of great uh, animation in that way. Also, yeah. a sign of the water in this movie is just amazing. Mm. I want to swim yeah. in it, swim in it uh, every day. Yeah, it looks a lot like the pond. It looks like a lot of like the water that you see in Ponyo, which I thought was kind of interesting. Absolutely, like, but I have a feeling we should. Uh head towards the yeah. the conclusion and yeah, uh, just final and thought uh, the character design of gina she is just the most gorgeous woman in all of anime uh <laughs> i will not tolerate any arguments it's just so so classy and classically beautiful man I, I i just love her face and her design and her singing i've had the 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 song the 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 Tom's De Cheris. I've had it stuck in my head since like I rewatched the film. Yes, no, no I yeah, rewatched it today, but I had it stuck in my head since <laughs> yesterday actually while reading up on like the, all the texts. It's, so, it's really good. Which is a great way to start talking about the ending because, yeah. like, as, as I we think mentioned, the big, the Tom the big elephant in the room. So important. Yeah. The big elephants in the room, I believe, are uh, the questions of whether or not Porco stops being a pig and whether Porco and Gina come together or not, because those are kind of like the capstones of what happened to Porco uh, throughout this entire film. So I, I, I already picked up on the sense that Ziff has a different take, uh, uh, that Porco, in fact, did not come together with Gina, or at least that it is very open. Well, I thought that was the case, because... Um... In the end, the ending narration, uh, Fio says she became very close friends with Gina, but never saw Por- Porco again. So yeah, but she was at Porco. Maybe she saw yeah. Mar- who is, Marco. Who, <laughs> yeah, who, who who is Porco? It is the man with the pig face. Yeah. Maybe the pig disappeared. Yeah. I mean, I guess that could be the true. last scene with Curtis. Also implies like Curtis, is like let me look at your face. No, let me look at your face. Yeah, that it seems almost definite that he he left the pig face behind. 
and, and if and if we assume that like you know his his pig likeness came from this kind of like you know insufficiency and like um survivor's guilt kind of thing, I think that it's pretty clear that like he's used these these like romances like fist fight with Curtis, his like like understanding of like women and women working and like and like Gina and like the, all these like different elements like of like understanding the world in this new way where he's like finally like been, and he's freed of like this like these meta narratives of like the hero and like how he should act. Um, if if we assume that these things are really effective, I think that the logical conclusion would be he has to have lost his pig face if the pig face came. Yeah. From that. Also, it would be just an unsatisfying movie if his yeah. development and, like didn't go and anywhere. A, and, a, and I suppose about Gina. So in the in the scene where the narration happens and we're having a shot panning across the Adriano Hotel, when you look very closely, and for you guys I posted in the Porco Rosso shed, you look very closely back there on the behind side of the island. Look, it, not it's the, the, front it's the, the ship from Cowboy Bebop. Spikes <laughs> on the <laughs> personal. Wow. <laughs> Holy shit. Find out. It's the greatest <laughs> crossover of all time. It's like it was Spike and Gina. They finally got together as they should have. <laughs> Now, anyways, it is, of course, the Crimson Red Airplane. Porco Rosso's plane is behind there on the side where you would get to the garden and the house. Also, uh, even more important, the final shot of the film, uh, the garden, Gina isn't there. Yeah, she isn't waiting. Yep. Yeah, ex exactly. So either Gina gave up, which that's definitely not something she would do. or <laughs> He's you know, literally there. He parked his plane there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, also, yeah, the phrasing of the ending really does help it, where it's like, I didn't see Porco again, because as we established, like, Porco is this identity, this hero character he has assumed, and Gina knows that he's deep down, he's Marco. Porco is a, is a mythical uh, figure he's intent on playing the role of, but now he's left yeah, she, it all behind. She, she, she's the, I think she's the only character in the movie that calls him Marco. Yeah, I believe so. Yep. And she, again, she, it, she it, it's, it's this thing with, with having, this having a past as, like, something valuable. Even even if it's a sad one, like like you have these people who know you like in a in a deeper way. I think and that's she, yeah, really and, she, and she's the only one who never participates in any of like any of like you know the the, the war games. Like she calls them war games, calls them what they are. She like comes and interrupts their fist fight. All the fascists are coming. Like comes. Over. She's always the one like pointing out. Oh look, it's, this is all a fantasy. Like and I'm looking at what is real. What is like what is true about these characters. What is true about the the world and the situation. It's a, it's, it's, it's a different like I I think it's just. The different ways of like maintaining uh, the, the, their lives, their individuality in uh, in this during their circumstances. Like uh, uh, Gina seems more like actively anti-fascist. Like she has that whole spy radio thing, which like just great little detail that just reveals so much about what her character is up to. Oh um, yeah, <laughs> like, like that's the only like indication apart from the whole like this is neutral ground no one fucks with and of course the socialist song yeah and the socialist song is like it's subtle but like she's obviously like uh th this pa pac yeah. Pacif yeah, pacifistic uh anti-fascist where like but I, I still think like porco and th there's this moment when uh when few asked who are all these people who've come to the fight and he's like it's the the scum of the adriatic and it, and he says it with with such like a kind of love like these are all the outcasts, all the people who don't fit into society, which, and at this point in the film, like, society means, like, this nationalism. They're, they're all yeah. just there to have fun. And I think it's it, it's a kind of way to rebel. Yeah. Uh, just, yeah. He, here's also a, a little de thing. detail. Um, one moment. Um, little detail. Um, when Porco is going to, um, early in the film, he's going to withdraw money. Um, he goes, he, he talks about, oh, I'm, like, I'm separate from all this, like, this, like, government. I'm, like, he's, like, he's, like I'm, like, I'm not, not, like, one of you guys. I'm not, I'm a pig. I'm not, like, one of you, like, he's, like, you fascists. Um, and there's immediately cut after that. And there's a pirate with his, pl with the, the pirates, with their, you know, their plane had been damaged by Porco in the early movie. Their plane has been fixed, but they can't paint it. Like, pirates don't take loans. And it's, like, this great, like, moment where, like, like, these people, like, removed from society. They remove, like, they won't, they don't, they don't work with, um, with these like these governmental structures, like these are all these people in this outside yeah. space. And also, interestingly enough, all these heroes and characters of old of old romance and adventure stories are all there as the outcast of society. They're all pigs, pirates, and like adventurous Americans and whatnot, all outcasts. And the fascists are coming. In a sense, I feel like this is a return of a good versus evil story that still works. Like mm -hmm. no matter where you come from, what you are, and what your previous situation was. We are like the kind of people who exist in this world which do not belong to that system and that system is trying to yeah. kill us. They're evil. Yeah. The fascists, we can clearly still say there's a place of resistance, there's a place yeah. for heroism and it is against fascism. Yeah, yeah, yeah like the, the whole, the fascists are coming. That, that That's a great like like way of putting like the, the whole background conflict of the film because like 
all these like strong characters, all, all these individualists that like st- the fascists are going to like strangle that individualism in a- any form it takes. Um, but at, at the same time, I mean, I'm, I, I know I'm kind of contradicting myself, but um, uh, I c- kind of like, like individualism isn't that big a part of Porco. Like he, he also has this contact. He's part of this community. Um, like, like we see it when, when he has that uh, guy yeah. he, he buys his uh, ammunitions from. Is, is clearly like a local craftsman. And he has that. Yeah, the movie starts off with him like in the secluded space. But the more you move to the movie, the more you see like it's 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 it's, it's this like rugged individualism is is almost it's almost it's 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 a myth even for Porco he knows he's part of a this 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 collective like like society of the Adriatic of this like like the individualism that he expresses is become when 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 contextualized in the um in the collective like um, um yeah and aesthetic of of the Adriatic becomes like this positive and like worthwhile thing rather than the negative self destructive thing it, it seems to be at the beginning yeah the family run workshop of old friends who are willing to give him credit even as they have a sign said saying non si fa credito uh in a, a, about no one gets credit but he's a friend and also when they uh, when they refuel in, in that island where there's there's this great little gas station uh, little shop little saloon that they go into um, uh, and Fio's complaining that hey th- these prices are insane what the hell and Porco's like well it's it, it's give and take it's a, like the economy is pretty bad and they I I know these honest people who who give me like honest product uh, so like that so he he's still part of that world even if he has this persona, this facade of being a, a loner and a bad guy. And that also like comes back to the question, right? That, that was posed at the beginning. Like if this um, sort of um, big meta narrative, uh, utopian ideal of living together as a society is a f- like, is a fraud, is like a, a farce. If that's, this can't work. If it's like, uh, if you can't find for societal meaning, in this way, then how do we come out in the other end? And I think throughout the movies, you can find answers for this. Uh, what you already have touched on here is that a sort of a joyous uh, collective um, um, solidarity doesn't necessarily have to come with uh, Vive la Révolution uh, flag waving, right? It's, it's also... Um, there's a very sort of anarchic feeling within the text of this film where um, this feeling of locality, of having just a solidarity, uh, solidarity and, and, and such a joyous relationship with one another that is already enough. Um, and that might seem kind of platitudinal and kind of apolitical on its own, However, what I think Miyazaki does very well in this film, or and everyone else who's worked on it, is that um, they see very clearly in this film that um, this stance is in fact not apolitical. In order to to kind of appreciate the day to day, the the everyday interactions between people, the sort of joyous uh, labor. Um, you have to become political and and create a sort of situation, a sort of uh, societal mode in which this way of life can be defended, in which this sort of labor can be defended. Because you know that when when the fascism really takes hold, you won't see that many women in the workshop anymore, right? Yeah, and and you, you won't have that um that hotel to go to that sanctuary anymore you won't have the pirates to fight the yeah. fun adventure is all gone yeah the fun adventure is all gone it's all it, it, you you will have to buy the incendiaries because now it's actually war yeah which is also why he talks to the weapons shop right the weapons shop is like yeah when the war's coming you know we're gonna still so if we're molds so what i think is so skillful in this film is how the surface is to, yes, let's not be political, let, let's not have this grandiose ideological vision, let's just live in the moment and day to day and, and just be cool with each other and have, have a lot of love and nice things. That's what it seems like it is, but it isn't really. It, 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 it takes into account the criticism of what it portrays, 
which is that yes if you do that th- that's fine but there's still this big fucking fascist thing going on and you're not gonna stop it by just escaping it right so then what is the solution well to have a solidarity and and the sort of uh collective identity a a sort of war machine of different people coming together that can resist as as Nyard said before that can have a place of resistance can be built against this form of oppression of, of fascism yeah and that i think is so key to uh, to uh, Paul Caruso and uh, and to Miyazaki in a way and and it's, it's something i really like i i think i've really realized going through these in, in more depth uh, like this um the reason why Paul Caruso feels like it's always felt like my favorite ghibli even like if i can see why other ghibli films might be more technically impressive or more structurally coherent and st- all, all that kind of stuff it's the it feels like it has like the soul that's so close to miyasaki's own um where his his films and himself aren't like escapists they're, they're not like an escape from reality but they are filled with yearning for for escape for adventure for uh, utopias that are already lost yeah, like for utopia. the castle must fly away right the castle in the sky so such motifs are very common in, in Miyazaki's work and Porco also bears that out in very explicitly real world political terms that also like really this yearning also present in the song from Gina this is also why it's my favorite Miyazaki movie so we're already like like here yeah. two people <laughs> really loving Porco also yeah <laughs> yeah just gushing about it uh yeah but 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 like the the thing is, like, like learning how it was made, how it started out as, okay, I'm going to make this escape. It was meant to be an escapist picture. Like, the, the whole tofu yeah. brain thing. Like, sit back and relax. But he, he, he just couldn't. Like, uh, part of it was obviously the historical context and uh, his, his sadness over the state of the world at the time. But I think part of it is just, like, who he is as a filmmaker. Uh, he, he, he can't not acknowledge like the, this darkness that's yeah. there uh, somewhere in the background uh, wherever you go and 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 this the hopelessness of hope in a way but he he still just really depicts this these characters in this world that, that really yearns that really wants that type of world to exist uh and i i, I think like rewatching this uh, a, a couple of times uh be- before uh, making this podcast there was those two musical like duet sequences um where porco lands uh for the first time at uh, the uh hotel and gina is singing uh le temps de series and later on when he uh flies around do, does those flying stunts this sort of flirting with her while she's in the garden i think th- those just really are one of my f- some of my favorite sequences in like maybe in all of cinema i think because they just capture that romance capital r romance that the, the, this yearning this wanting um in, in the first place gina's song which has all this historical context of wanting that utopia wanting that spring that doesn't end but knowing that it will end but you still have to like uh experience it and dare to love and so, so, so it has this political element and later the deeply personal just the two of them having this moment together as the music swells uh having this past together and again this yearning for a spring long before but before all you you have before you had all these worries about the state of the yeah. world i think just if any film maybe aside from the wind rises but we'll get to that if any film <laughs> is close to and personal close to Miyazaki's heart I, th- I think it's this one and I think that whole uh summary basically is a very profound note to end on except if any of you has still any thoughts to add uh, I don't have anything left to say about the film but I will uh I will definitely recommend if anyone wants similar feels to this uh you know a Sherlock Hound has multiple episodes the Miyazaki directed that are all like plane based and has a lot of cool things and if you want to see more cool planes definitely watch the uh the masamoto ova the cockpit that's the kind of the best example of animated planes outside porco rosa probably it's a uh, really quality also actually uh one one film that's weirdly like similar in the kind of the 
the machoist pursuit of like flight and everything that comes along with that is a Robert Redford film called The Great Waldo Pepper. And that I feel like uh, weirdly lines up with a lot of this thematically. All right. Thanks for the recommendations. Uh, also, I would recommend watching Casablanca, obviously. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, also, that's an inspiration, uh, yes. Also, uh, I, I, I watched uh, Wings, uh, 1927, a silent film that won the first Best Picture Prize uh, at the first Academy Awards. Well, Best Production, it was called back then. Um, and it, it's like, it really like defined the visual language of dogfighting. Uh, it's like about World War One, uh, a couple of friends who uh, become ace pilots uh, and crazy, crazy uh, special effects. Uh, but but there there are some echoes of it uh, in Porco Rosso actually, especially the the, the short flashback sequence of uh, the dogfight where uh, Porco lost his squadron. That that like when they um, the, the 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 falling planes are on fire. That's a that's a, an image like I think directly from uh, Wings. Um, mm. Also uh, the uh, the Dawn Patrol. Uh, it it's been made twice. One was with uh, Errol Flynn. It pretty much defined the look of uh like world war one uh, pilots like all the the scarves and the mustaches that, that that's where you get that from so that, that there's some cinema if you're interested in that and yeah, that's why we get uh, a cinema but the cinema not like like played on, on because nobody of us would have gotten <laughs> able to drop these references <laughs> uh, so yeah, also also uh Earl, Earl flynn and curtis clear like perils this uh, adventurer persona yeah. uh, from hollywood all right then I think that caps it off. So thanks for listening to the Narsicast. Uh Also check out our Discord server if you want to discuss any of our takes with us or any of the other Ghibli films or actually anything at all. We're interested in art. Just come hang out. We desperately need people. Come hang out. Link in the description. Also consider supporting our mic quality by giving us money on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Narsicast with a double A. This link is also in the description. And I believe next time we will meet to talk about uh, Ocean Waves, if I'm correct. Oh, that should be the next and one. And a great film. Yeah. It's, it's a good film. any sarcasm. It's, it's the first film that's not by Takahata or uh, Miyazaki uh, that we'll talk exactly. about. Exactly. And it's also funny enough, not a cinematic release, but uh, if I'm not mistaken, like a TV production. Yeah. So that's also going to have some different production markets. But we're going to get to that next month. So I will say see you then. Goodbye. See also, ya. remember, better to be a pig than a fascist. <laughs> True. <laughs> Heheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheh